morning, everyone. I'd like to call this regular meeting of the Sterling Heights City Council to order. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear God, please bless our elected officials. Grant them courage and wisdom to do what is right for all citizens. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ms. Riska. Can we please have the roll call? <clears throat> Mayor Taylor? Here. Mrs. Saraski? Here. Mrs. Kosky? Present. Mr. Radke? Present. Mrs. Schmidt? Present. Mr. Yanez? Here. And Mrs. Yarko? Present. Thank you, Council. We need approval of the agenda. Mr. Mayor? Mrs. Kosky? Move to approve the agenda. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? No discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. First item on our agenda tonight is a report from our city manager, Mark Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool. Thank you, Mayor. Let me uh, start out by an update uh, on our uh, new election operation location, and then I'm going to conclude with uh, two special presentations that we have under my report this evening. Uh, first, just as a reminder for everyone, uh, as of last uh, Monday, July 13th, all election operations have been moved to the senior center, so right across the street. Uh, to alleviate some of the foot traffic that we have at uh, City Hall. So those of you who have been to City Hall recently know that our operations are very confined, uh, certainly due to the social distancing that's required now, uh, but also because of all the renovations that are going on at City Hall. Uh, so by moving the election operations across the street to the senior center, uh, individuals are able to conduct that business in a very um, conducive environment for social distancing and, and the like. And as you know, uh, the senior center is close to what, what have been normal traditional senior activities. So this actually works out quite well. So what you can do there is register to vote, apply for an absentee voter ballot, obtain AV uh, ballots. You can spoil an AV ballot or ask any uh, miscellaneous questions and the like regarding uh, the upcoming uh, primary and general election. The election center is open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And for the convenience of uh, residents, the center will also be open on Saturday, August 1st, and that's from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The city clerk's main office at City Hall will continue to conduct all non-election duties such as licensing, death certificates, FOIA requests, notary services, board and commission applications, and more. So uh, please be reminded of that uh, change in operations. And I'm really excited to talk about this uh, next topic. It comes under the uh, banner of our Sterling Heights Initiative for Neighborhood Excellence, known as SHINE. As many of you know, we've had uh, many activities that, that have been implemented or occur under SHINE, including our SHINE Cleanup Day. In fact, we just had one this past Saturday and had a great turnout. Normally, we have them in the spring and the fall, but because of COVID, we had to move it to summer. It's a great program where uh, volunteers come out and help those who are just not able to maintain their homes for one reason or another uh, do that work. It's just a wonderful program. And that program, along with our normal code enforcement efforts, uh, really helps to keep our neighborhoods in good condition and property values strong, which is obviously very important. And what we've been working on over the last year or so is our Safe Homes Task Force. And we're gonna hear from two individuals tonight, uh, Megan Ahern and Mike Vizenko, to talk about this program. But again, it fits nicely under our Action with the Shine program, because as you're gonna hear, this is a major problem uh, that communities across the nation are facing. And in Sterling Heights, we've come up with a um, a method and action plan to deal with it very proactively. So, Mayor, I'd like to uh, start out by introduce, introducing our special projects coordinator, Megan Ahern, who has spent a lot of time leading this effort along with Mike Vizenko and our city attorney 
in others. inhabiting two or more rooms. There may be some light odors, maybe overflowing trash cans, mildew in kitchens and bathrooms. One exit could be blocked. Um, there's some but limited evidence of housekeeping. So when it compounds a little bit more, we go to level three. Conditions are more serious where one bedroom or bathroom is completely unusable. There's excessive dust, heavily soiled food preparation areas, strong odors throughout the home, excessive number of pets, and the clutter starts to appear on the outside of the home. A level four, there might be an unaddressed sewer backup, hazardous electrical wiring, 
insect infestation on sanitary food on counters, pet damage to the home. And then at level five, we've reached the epitome of unlivable conditions. There could be a rodent infestation. The kitchen and bathroom are com completely unusable due to clutter. There may be human and or animal waste. Electrical and or water service could be disconnected. So once we've done the home assessment and we've determined what level this house is at, we move on to step three. And in this step, the assessments are turned over to the building department and they are entered into our BSNA system, much like our, um, our, code, our code violations are entered into BSNA. Um, so then that's gonna bring us to our final step. And BSNA is going to automatically generate for us the, the notifications for the Safe Homes Task Force. It's going to send out notifications to everyone um, on the email list uh, so that we, it'll prompt us to do further inspections on the house and contact further agencies if necessary. Okay, so now that you're familiar with the process and the level scale, building official Mike Vizenko will walk you through the response or the actions taken by the city for each level, as well as some additional information. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Mr. Vanderpool, Mr. Kaszewski. With the creation of Safe Homes Task Force, there was also a need to develop a process to respond to complaints when received. We began with creating a way to track these cases with the ability to schedule follow-up inspections. Since we already have a permit tracking system in place, we were able to work with the software company and generate a new style permit. This makes, this, this makes it happen at no cost. After participating in a meetings hosted <clears throat> excuse me, by other organizations throughout the state, we felt it would be best to follow similar processes already in place but tailored to our community. In efforts to move, more move to a more consistent format, we took the grading scale from what was 10 categories down to five. <clears throat> Typically, a home at a level one is discovered by our code enforcement officers out on daily, daily inspections. They perform follow-up inspections and monitor the home to see if, it, if the case worsens. These homes are typically monitored for a couple months on the exterior only. When we discover a home that is at a level two, a resident is mailed information about the condition of their home. This lets them know that there's been a complaint filed and it will be monitored. These documents are mailed directly to the residents. Here is a copy of the risk assessment form that is sent to the resident. We also include a checklist for information identifying common violations that may exist. This lets, the, the, this lets them know that the living conditions are becoming concerning. Level three homes typically are discovered by the police when they're called out for a wall to the residents for a wellness check. There are times that they are unsure of the conditions and ask for assistance from the building department as well as the fire department. The police file a case with the community health and APS. The home is followed up through the BSNA permit tracking system and monitored by code enforcement for the exterior while the building department works with the residents to get to work on cleaning up the interior. Similar to a level three, a home at level four is discovered by either police or fire. Due, due to the elevated conditions of the home, they need to call in the building department for a complete assessment. <clears throat> police and fire both contact the agency for the aging, the county, as well as APS to get them involved to begin their investigation. When a home is at a level four, they are given 30 days to make progress to make the home safer to live in. We also begin communications at the time of assessment with the resident living in the home to 
try to reach out to the family members, other family members, to gain extra help for them. Like, we, like mentioned earlier, level five is typically concerning that the home may become a biohazard situation. Whichever discipline arrives first, police or fire, they call in the others, including the building department, for an assessment. Since fire has the protective gear and is trained with the proper respirators, they can enter the home safely and provide the team with pictures of areas that we can't gain access to. Level five homes are posted with a no occupancy sign as well as padlocked. Both the police and fire contact agency for agency for, of the, for the aging statewide intake and the county. At this level, the conditions on the inside of the home are severe enough that the occupants are at risk and all the agencies must be informed. With the program already in place, we had the ability to adjust it as we, as we feel it's needed. One of the latest cases, I actually conducted a virtual inspection of a, of a hoarder situation with assistance from the fire department personnel. And that call came in at two o'clock on a Saturday morning. So I was, I was willing to try an innovative way of doing an inspection at that time of the day. <laughs> that, that project worked out great. We were able to adjust the BSNA permit system so that now I can log that in as a actual virtual inspection instead of just a normal inspection. This helps keep our, our records accurate. The program still improving. We look to include additional members as part of this team. By increasing the members, we feel this will aid in making this an, a successful program. Mentioned earlier, last summer, we, we first introduced our program to a large group at our Velocity Building. We intended to host regularly scheduled meetings, but COVID-19 has put that on temporary hold. We will begin those meetings in the future, but probably will be done via Zoom. Having input from other government agencies will provide good resources for our residents to take advantage of if they choose to. The internal staff has met on several occasions, to, several occasions to create this program with a very solid foundation. Knowing that things will have to be adjusted as time goes on, it won't be too difficult. As you can imagine, a program like this has a lot of follow-up work to be done. Last winter, we began the budget, for the 2021 budget process and requested and had support to hire a part-time social worker. This person would perform follow-up site inspections, um, <clears throat> follow up with the state and the county, as well as meet with the residents to assure the residents that the city of Sterling Heights is here to help them. Though that position was supported as a part -time, in the part-time budget, the process was eliminated due to necessary budget cuts from the COVID-19 pandemic. There are hopes that this position will be reestablished in the future to keep this program right on track. Thank you very much, and that concludes our presentation for the Safe Homes Task Force. And I just want to conclude by Again, mentioning that uh, this is a vital component now to our overall SHINE program and helping neighbors, uh, residents stay in their home and, and receiving help when they need it. So I wanted to uh, thank uh, certainly Megan and Mike for the good work on the program and again the city attorney and uh, Jason Castor and so many others that spent a lot of time on this. And moving on, uh, last year the City Council created the Youth Advisory Board and they've been hard at work on many initiatives and they're before us this evening. And starting out uh, this presentation is uh, Marissa Russo, our Digital Content Coordinator, and she's going to begin and then we're going to hear from some of the Advisory Board members. and council and mayor for giving us the opportunity to present tonight. Um, first, I just want to say that the city of Sterling Heights has developed significant amenities throughout the city um, that has better enhanced the quality of life for our 13 to 18 year old uh, demographic throughout the city, um, such as the skate park, the ice rink, we have canoeing on the Clinton River. Uh, we've enhanced our bike and walking <coughs> trails, um, as well as now have the community center, which offers a teen room, as well as a gym that has drop-in activities and so much more. 
Um, but we have found through our Youth Advisory Board that um, we, better, we have to better promote these activities and amenities to their age group. Um, there's a lack of communication, and that's something we definitely feel that this group is going to help better promote. Um, as well as talking with them, they have community issues that they want to better promote as well, and they want to have the opportunity to have a hand in those situations. So um, we know that this group is going to better enhance those opportunities as well as giving them the opportunity to work with you guys um, through civic engagement and working with local government. So here to present uh, tonight our strategic plan is our Youth Advisory Board Chair, um, Ann Payne, and our co-chair, Max Stefanski. Hello, it's very nice to be here. So do we have a presentation? So for the advisory board, um, our general uh, consensus we've reached uh, talking among ourselves is that uh, first, we feel there aren't enough opportunities for civic engagement with uh, the teen community and the local government. And also the ex activities that do exist, uh, they're just not as well known as we would like them to be. So engagement is relatively low and we're hoping to change that. Problem statement is to develop and promote programs, services, amenities, events, and civic engagement opportunities that make Sterling Heights a more appealing community for those of 13 and 18 to 18 ages. Uh, our overall goal is to engage area teens in local government and advocacy for important community issues like sustainability, mental health and diversity, and also inclusion. So uh, the first uh, goal uh, subcommittee we'll be talking about is sustainability, where the idea behind sustainability is we want to encourage the youth uh, as well as the community as a whole to become more green and sustainable and so we can you know, live more sustainably and make the world a little better. So a measurable goal, objective that uh, this subcommittee set for themselves is they want to engage local youth in the practice of a sustainable lifestyle by developing two types of non-motorized transport in at least five different locations across the city before June 30th, 2022. And they want to have at least 10 locations across the city before June 30th, 2024. So, so the strategy that we have come up with for the sustainability uh, committee is to work with parks and recreation to generate resources and create a plan for putting scooters and bikes for rent in areas like public parks and high traffic commercial areas. The idea behind that is they want to give people an option to get between the different places in the city that are relatively far apart that you would probably normally just want to go by car and have them do a scooter instead, which is much better for the environment. Right, the, next, uh, yeah, the next group we'll be talking about is the mental health subcommittee, where um, they want to provide resources and opportunities for the youth in our community to educate and support mental health issues. Um, their current objective they're shooting for is to increase awareness regarding mental health issues among area youth by hosting at least one mental health awareness event that engages at least 250 attendees by June 30th, 2021. The strategy that they have come up with is to develop a juried teen film festival featuring a teen-created mental health PSAs and secure sponsorship for prizes. Just try and get people to engage with that, and film festival seems like a good uh, way of doing that. So the next uh, group, we have uh, diversity and inclusion, where we want to promote you know, the inclusion of all the diverse communities that do live in Sterling Heights, especially among the youth. So, their uh, current measurable objective is they want to promote the creation of safe environments for uh, these people. They want to create at least six safe spaces and resource meetups with a target of uh, 25 attendees each by June 30th, uh, 2021. And their strategy was to identify speakers, cr create educational resources, and plan activities to provide at meetups hosted at the community center teen room 
and also to develop campaigns to share educational resources broadly in between meetups. All right, so the final group we'll be talking about today is our local government awareness subcommittee. Because uh, we've uh, found out that the majority of youth have very little idea what actually goes on in their local government. And we want to change that. We want to educate the youth on local government and provide opportunities to engage with the local government. So that we encourage people to learn even more and get just more involved with their community in general. Uh, the current objective we want to fulfill is we want to educate teen groups on local government and increase opportunities to serve and connect with the city by engaging 120 students in four local government education sessions by June 30th, 2022. And the strategy to do this is to plan and ex execute educational events for local school districts, uh, governmental classes, demonstrating local government operations, and highlighting opportunities for involvement targeted to teens. Government teachers have vo uh, that I've talked to have voiced uh, support for such a plan where they because they, they want their students to engage with the local government. So we want to provide that information for them in you know, like an hour presentation for the day and then uh, we hope that we can create like different events or whatever that we can encourage the students to go to that involve city officials that get them interested and excited about local government. <clears throat> so that's all we have for today if there are any questions. Well, I want to thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Mark, I'll jump in, or Mr. Vanderpool, I'll jump in right now uh, briefly. Uh, and thank you for these uh, very thoughtful and um, really thought-provoking um, slides that you've presented and ideas that you've presented, things that, frankly, I don't think any of us up here maybe would have thought about, like a, a juried uh, a film festival. Like, that's a, a, an incredibly good idea that I never would have thought of. And so I guess uh, since we have you here, uh, and, and frankly, that is the reason why we created this board in the first place, mm -hmm. is to solicit those ideas. So I would say, uh, without any objection, Mr. Vanderpool, I'll open it up to my colleagues uh, for any questions or thoughts or comments uh, while we have these uh, two members of the Teen Advisory Board here. Mrs. Sorowski. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, so through the chair to our advisory board members. I guess I don't, I don't have too many questions. Well, I have a couple, sorry. So how many, how many members do you have right now? Um, I think about a dozen or so. Okay, that's a good number. Uh, we're, that's, you know, of course we would like to have more. We were, there's 17 that we're hoping to fill the five-ish and then others that may wanna just participate. This is, as Mayor Taylor said, this is exactly what we want because we can think, you know, even us who have, and I myself and some of the others here, have older children, you know, some of us have younger children, and we think we might know what works, but we, we probably don't. And we need to have your involvement and to, to really, it, it is very thought-provoking, it is very insightful, your, your presentations, your strategies are things we wouldn't have thought of and the methodology and the measurable um, objectives are very, um, I guess I would like to say adult, but wonderful that you guys have come up with it because it really is something that works, you know, in, in, in the grand scheme of things. So I'm very impressed, excited, and I do think that hopefully with this platform and the start, and I would like to probably encourage our city TV group and our city administration to find a way to put this presentation out to the, the on, on whatever media that we can use to, to help encourage other teens to see what they've got because the kids don't always, or people don't always, even adults don't wanna join something if they don't really understand what it's all about. Now this gives them something to focus on, different groups to become involved with, so very good. So they, thank you very much. I would like to say though, with the local government, that is like one of the ways we want to expand because that is one of the very easy youth-centered ways you can engage with the local government. So uh, with the pandemic, we weren't able to do that this school year, but hopefully in the future, that will be a good tool for us to expand even more and bring in more ideas. Very good, thank you. Council, anyone else? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarco. 
First of all, I want to thank you both for being here today and for all the time that you've put into this presentation. And surely I would like a copy of your presentation. But, um, you know, there are some topics that you brought up to us that on an adult level, we look at one way. But finding out that it's equally as important or more important to you um, means something. So it means that we're, you know, working in the right direction that we can work together. Um, I, I have to say that the one part um, that really struck me today is how important you feel mental health is. Mm -hmm. And that is at any age. So, and, and the fact that you already are aware of the need to help people um, in that area, it, I, I can't thank you enough for bringing that up to us tonight. Um, the other thing is when we talk about local government awareness, I guess I would want some information is, are you interested in what actually goes on in City Hall or as council members and what involved there? So if we can go into that into detail. And then the last question I might have is, do you want us to reach out to you directly or through your advisor? So that if we have your contact information, we could actually you know, either sit down or do some kind of Zoom call so that we could actually have a conversation. So if you could let us know that, I would really appreciate it. And, and thank you again. Um, your information was very valuable tonight. Thank you. Council, anyone else? Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I want to thank you both, and I want you to take back to all your colleagues how, how grateful we are for the, the job you're doing. You know, it's yeah. always great to hear from the next generation of leadership in the city, and I think you guys are well on your way. I mean, especially to have subcommittees that are going into the details on this. It's just, I'm just very impressed. The one thing that I want, or the two things I want to really hit upon are, are these are some of the ideas the city is already moving forward on, but we'd love to have your ideas and support. I know that we've created a sustainability commission that's going to look at different ways to increase sustainability in the city. Um, I love the idea of scooters or bikes. Uh, I don't know if we have the infrastructure for it, but I'd love to see them here in Sterling Heights. I also want to touch upon the diversity and inclusion push. And I think that that's something you're going to see more and more from the youth and the idea that uh, our society has to reflect all of us, especially in government else and outside of government. So I want to commend you for that. And yeah, I'd be interested in uh, attending a safe space training just to see how you guys are conducting it. I don't want to intrude, but I think it'd be fascinating. So if I could come, I think it'd be wonderful. I'm sure they would be very pleased to have you. Yeah. Uh, I just want to thank you again for all the work you've done. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm honestly impressed. I can see great things from you guys in the future. So thank you so much. Mayor Taylor. Mr. Schmidt. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank you as well for your um, fantastic presentation. I was thinking that I would like a copy as well. So if you guys could, could provide that for us. Um, a couple of things that you did um, touch on the sustainability. Um, we're actually filling a, a commission mm -hmm. um, tonight for our sustain, uh, adult sustainability um, committee. And um, just as a discussion point, I wouldn't mind um, having one of your representatives as kind of a pseudo person on that board or, or commission um, just to sit in and, and um, not be one of the fully appointed members, but have, have someone from the Youth Advisory Board um, sit in and, and really um, contribute to that um, maybe uh, administration can look into the process of having that done, or if my colleagues um, want to discuss that, that'd be fine. Um, I happen to work with high school kids and see a lot of um, the mental health issues and the struggles and the home struggles that um, so many students are dealing with, and a lot of them that do not even have the support at home. We are pretty much the only support they have is at school. Um, so um, I am excited that you want to really focus on, on the mental health and, and the safe spaces. Um, as far as government awareness, I also have the opportunity of speaking with some government classes at Sterling Heights High School and thoroughly enjoy that the day that I get to spend with those kids. It's very interesting some of the questions that they come up with that as an adult and an elected official I would never think of. 
Um, but it's important to them and, and it's important that we know what those, those issues are. So I thank you, um, you know, so much for your presentation and your willingness to be involved. Hopefully we can get a few more kids on the, or students on that um, advisory board and, and fill it up. Um, and I'm just wondering how you think we could get more students to want to be involved. Uh, I think definitely a lot of it is just awareness because uh, like when I like if I ever like talk to my friends at school like oh I have to go to the youth advisory board thing like they just have no clue what it is and mm -hmm. even some of them like they vaguely talk about it like they're like oh that's kind of interesting so I am sure if we were to do more presentations like this in school in future years in like you know government classes for like 11th grade or and we can uh, definitely talk to maybe going to like the junior high schools and history classes. I'm sure we could get a lot of more kids involved because I'm sure a lot of people would love to do this. Well, I thank you. I thank you for wanting to be involved and caring about our community and how the future uh, shapes itself. And, and you um, all are part of that. So thank you again. Good job. Anyone else? Mrs. Mrs. Kosky. Thank you. You are doing a fantastic job. You're doing exactly what we had hoped that you would be doing. We're here to assist you with anything that we can. And as Ms. Smith said, we're willing to help you increase your membership. If you have any ideas how we can help you, how we can reach out to the other students. I would like to know what is the uh, age that you currently have? What I think you said about 12 members you have now. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the exact number. I think it's about there. It might be, I think it's a bit more, but I think most of the kids are high school kids. <clears throat> okay, are they like seniors, juniors? I think the biggest group this like past year was uh, juniors. Uh, it's, it's like 10th, 11th, 12th seem to be the largest group. I would like to reach out more to junior high kids and get them involved a bit uh, earlier. Is like that's obviously you know more people for longer more ideas and all that but I think currently the majority of us are 10 11 12 are they coming back for uh, a second year in other words once they become members do they come back the next year well, are you retaining your membership is what I'm asking well I mean we've only been around for like a year we haven't really I, we haven't been around long enough to really see that. I have assumed so. I haven't seen anyone like just drop out yet that like is still living here and is like turning 18 or moving away. So I think as of now we've retained all of our members, but I would say we haven't really been around long enough to say for sure. Okay, if you have any ideas how we can reach out to middle school maybe, please, please let us know. I also have a suggestion for you. If you want to learn more about government, we have Ms. Sarko, who is on the Board of Trustees, Michigan Municipal League. The mayor is a member of the Mayor's National, what do you call it? U U.S. Conference of Mayors. <laughs> U.S. Conference of Mayors, okay. And I'm sure that they would love to give you guidance as to what's going on in those committees. And I think you would enjoy it. You get a, uh, another aspect of uh, local government. So keep up the good work. We're here to help you with whatever you need. Thank you. Yes, and unfortunately, there was going to be a... Uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors has a youth involvement task force that was planning on meeting this past weekend in Portland. Um, of course, there's a lot going on in Portland right now and, and obviously there's no opportunity to do um, in-person meetings like we had hoped at the beginning of the year. But uh, there, is, there are a lot of opportunities um, that, uh, that that organization presents for, uh, for youth involvement. And um, so we'll, we'll be in touch more about that. I think that anyone else in on this? So, Again, thank you very much. We appreciate your presentations. We appreciate your leadership on this. Uh, we, we hope to, to have uh, continued uh, dialogue with you and new ideas like this and look forward to implementing uh, all these uh, ideas. So thank you again. Mr. Vanderpool. Mayor, just in closing, I wanted to thank Mr. Payne 
Mr. Stefanski for their outstanding presentation. I also wanted to recognize uh, once again Marissa Russo for her good work and our Community Relations Director Melanie Davis for their outstanding work uh, coordinating efforts uh, with youth, youth Advisory Board. And Mayor, that concludes my report this evening. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Vanderpool. Uh, thank you both again. The next item on our agenda is a presentation. We have two presentations tonight uh, of the Nice Neighbor Award. The first uh, presentation of the Nice Neighbor Award is going to be uh, presented by our Community Relations Director, Melanie Davis. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mayor and members of council, members of city management. As we are all aware, uh, census completion is critical to funding of very important programs that our residents, community programs that our residents use every day. And as a part of our 2020 census campaign that we have been working on, we recruited several census ambassadors who had agreed at the time to do things like hang door tag reminders and host education events and completion events throughout the city. Well, when COVID hit, we were no longer able to engage in those activities. So the Census Bureau actually, they quickly pivoted and they provided us an option to do something called a virtual phone bank. And what the virtual phone bank did was it allowed our volunteers to make reminder phone calls to people, our residents, about uh, filling out their census form. And we were really excited about that opportunity because while traditional marketing and advertising and social media are great ways to reach out to people and encourage them to complete their census, we really felt that it was that personal, direct, one-on-one -on -one touch that was the best way to get people to fill out their census and answer any questions they might have about the process. So we were really excited about that opportunity. Um, and also, you know, a phone call can't be scrolled past and it's difficult to miss a phone call amidst lots of other marketing messages that are floating around out there. So we thought that was a really good program that the Census Bureau offered us. So that being said, I'd like to formally recognize three of our volunteers who not only raised their hands to be census ambassadors, but also who agreed when we had to pivot to make some of those census reminder calls through our virtual phone bank. And collectively to date, those three volunteers have made nearly 1,800 phone calls to residents, reminding them to fill out their census 2020 form. And this work was particularly important when uh, the Census Bureau's door knocking enumerators were delayed uh, with the COVID, the pandemic. In addition, the efforts of these three individuals resulted in the city of Sterling Heights literally blowing away every other municipality that was participating in that virtual phone bank. I mean, there was no, no comparison at all. So tonight, I ask you all to join me in thanking Joelle Neal, Janan Arabu, and Nancy Subhan and honoring them tonight with a nice neighbor award for once again, helping make the city of Sterling Heights second to none. And I know Nancy couldn't be here, but I do believe Joelle and Janana are here. If they could come up, we'll get you your, your nice neighbor award. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Davis, and uh, thank you very much to you two ladies for all the work you did. Uh, we we kind of, we had a big plan this year for the census, and it all got thrown off track. But uh, we are doing uh, really well compared with other municipalities in the state. I don't know, uh, I know at one point we were leading the nation in our response rate for our city our size. 
I don't know if we still are and uh, or if we're still in the top 10, but um, it's it's because of the efforts uh, we put forward and the volunteerism from people like you. So thank you for all that you've done to, to help uh, the city of Sterling Heights. So with that, we do have another presentation of the Nice Neighbor Award tonight. And I will, for that one, I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Michael Radke, Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have the honor and privilege of presenting a Nice Neighbor Award to Patricia Barr, Pat for short. She's one of my best neighbors. And the reason I put her up for this award was I was coming back from a trip just la uh, two weeks ago, and I observed her cutting the grass on a vacant home and on, on our block for the fourth time this summer so far. She goes above and beyond in almost everything she does. I, I see her walking the neighborhood. She looks in on a lot of our, our neighbors who are older. She buys them groceries. Uh, I know that she's helped one or two up from a fall because they called her. She does everything she can to make our neighborhood the great, the great place that it is to live. And uh, I actually didn't have the idea of giving this award to her. One of my neighbors stopped by and praised her for cutting that lawn for the fourth time. She says, you know that Pat's been cutting that lawn all summer long. I said, I know I saw her do it once before. And she said, you know, she, she, you should get some honor for that. And I said, of course, that's the best thing for her. So she sadly could not make it tonight, but we're going to send her the certificate. And we want to praise her and thank her for all the work she does to make Sterling Heights the great place it is to live. Thank you, Patricia Barr. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Radke, and thank you to uh, Ms. Barr for her uh, efforts that were recognized tonight. Moving on, the next item on our agenda tonight is a consideration item, and this is to consider introduction of an ordinance replacing Chapter 29 of the City Code of Ordinances to create the Sterling Heights Business Licensing Ordinance. We have a presentation from our city clerk, Melanie Riska. Ms. Riska. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor, Council, Mr. Vanderpool, Mr. Kraszewski, and members of the audience. Tonight we're introducing an amendment to the Business Registration Ordinance, which is one part of a three-part business license project. So I'll give you a little bit of background. As you know, businesses are a vital part of our community. They stimulate economic growth, jobs, provide goods and services to our residents and visitors. The city puts forth a tremendous effort to encourage business owners to locate here. This has led to an estimated 4,000 businesses in Sterling Heights. Part of the appeal for businesses to locate here is our commitment to provide the best fire, police, and administrative, administrative services possible to keep our businesses, residents, and, vis our businesses, residents, and visitors safe. Currently, we require, a, to, we require businesses to register with the clerk's office and pay a one-time registration fee and submit an annual renewal registration at no cost. Of the estimated 4,000 businesses, just over 2,000 are registered, and only half of those file an annual renewal. This leads to outdated contact information, so when an emergency arises, our police and fire do not have a way to get a hold of the owner or management. And if there's a fire, the fire department needs to know what chemicals might be in the structure to know how to safely combat it. The city also offers multiple specialty licenses that require a separate application and approval process, such as outdoor patios, amusement devices, liquor licenses, hotel licenses, etc. The business, one business could have multiple licenses, and part of this project is to implement a central database to house all business information, including specialty license endorsements and to automate the system, making it easy for business owners to update their information on a regular basis. To achieve this goal, city administration has been working diligently to find a solution to encourage businesses to be licensed, give the community and city departments the most up-to-date business information, and streamline the current process, which is almost 100% manual. We have identified a three-part solution, and they are as follows. One, revise the current business ordinance to create an annual business license requirement. Two, implement software to house data that can be accessed across multiple departments and can accommodate multiple license types. And three, develop an online automation portal that makes it easy for businesses to apply and pay for a license online. First, before you tonight for your consideration is a proposed business license ordinance. This ordinance incorporates best practices based on research of communities that issue general business licenses. 
Second, Council recently approved the purchase of BSNA financial software package that also includes the business license module. This will house all business and specialty license information. This data will be shared between departments, eliminating the current division of information on multiple platforms. And finally, on the consent agenda tonight, contingent on the introduction and ultimate approval of the proposed ordinance, administration has worked with Ashling Partners to develop the K2 digital process automation. This is a completely customized application that will allow business owners to log on to our website to apply for any business license or type, um, including specialty license endorsements. Businesses will be able to upload necessary documentation and pay fees online. The second component of the automation process is in addition to the BSNA software to allow the import and export of information from the portal um, when businesses go to update their information. This ordinance um, that is before you tonight, coupled with the automation software, will streamline the process and make it easy for businesses to apply for and renew a license. Additionally, requiring a business license and using this web-based software will allow police and fire and other departments to access important information from an online portal and to better serve the residents and businesses of the city. Some benefits to this new program. Businesses can apply, upload documents, and pay online for a general license and any necessary specialty licenses. So there's no more taking time out of their busy day to come down to City Hall and apply in person or have a snail mail um, documents to them. Businesses can update their information at any time. So whenever there's a change in management, they can easily go on to our online portal and be able to update the appropriate emergency contact information. Or if the nature of their business changes, they can do that as well. Um, police and fire will have the most up-to-date emergency and alarm contact information at their fingertips, helping businesses protect their assets. Many times we get reports of a business that might have a broken window or the alarm goes off and they have, um, our police department has a difficult time getting a hold of a business owner to uh, notify them um, for them to be able to come and make sure that, you know, all their assets are protected. They're also when we start to obtain um, business license information, we will have an opportunity or a method by which we can easily disperse emergency information to either select businesses in a certain area or all businesses as a whole via email. So if you think about the COVID pandemic, we would have easily been able to have send an email out to businesses, letting them know of any um, COVID related information, or if there are if there's road construction come on, coming up, we will be able to notify businesses prior to that road construction so that they can prepare, um, you know, for their business. And then um, also, it's free advertising. So with this online portal, we will be able to develop a, um, a list of businesses that we can provide to the public, and that would have the business's name, the type of business, their website, their phone number, and those sorts of things that our public or our residents may want. Um, so administration is proposing an annual license fee of $75 to offset the cost of the program. However, in light of the recent pandemic and because many businesses are um, still struggling, the, we are proposing that the 2021 uh, fees be waived for the, that general business license. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm available to answer any questions about the program, and we also have our assistant city attorney, Don Denault, in the audience that can answer or ask, you can ask questions about the ordinance. Thank you very much, Ms. Riska. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? If not, council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. Resolved to introduce the ordinance replacing Chapter 29 of the City Code of Ordinances to create the Sterling Heights Business Licensing Ordinance. <clears throat> Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Ms. Sorowski? Um, I, actually, I don't have any questions. I believe Ms. Riska did such a, she did a very good job explaining what this really needs, the needs and the reasons and the application of it, so I'm fine with what we've had. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Zarko? Um, yes. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, I like the idea, well, first of all, through the chair to Mr. Donald. Um, 
Is he, I can't see that. He's he's over he's there. I can't see my Okay. <laughs> uh, my question is, is it um, because of the fee? We're leaving the fee in the ordinance, but we're already waiving it for the first year. And I just want to make sure it is, does it have to be listed anywhere that besides in uh, what we're voting on tonight that it has, um, that there is no cost for that first year? So that's only my, that's my question is because if the ordinance says it's a $75 fee, then how do we put in place that it's been waived for that first year? Because I have to agree with you, it should be waived at least for the first year and we'll see how people are coming out of this. Um, that's my question. Mr. Denault. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, the ordinance itself doesn't actually set a fee. It just says that the fee will be established by city council in the annual appropriation ordinance. So uh, as we go forward with any adjustments to that ordinance this current fiscal year, uh, it can be left out or it could be made clear in the ordinance that there will be no fee for the licensing this year and the fee will begin in 2022. Thank you. Okay, and the other thing is, the other comment I have is I like the fact that it's going to be like a directory for um, all of the businesses that are in the city. And I think in what people pay for advertising to advertise their business at $75 a year, it would be a bargain to have um, this print, I would hope a printed directory as well as something that's online. So I think that's a really good idea. So I'm definitely in support of this um, new ordinance. Mrs. Koski. Thank you. Mr. Denault, don't go away, please. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, didn't we have this um, business registration for a number of years and it was very difficult to get the, uh, the information? Am I remembering correctly? You are. I remember the fee being like $25. Is there a reason why 75 would be suggested? I would partially defer to Ms. Riska. My understanding, of course, is that the program has costs. Uh, the new licensing program has software costs and licensing fees uh, for the city to develop the software. So a slight increase is being proposed. I don't think it's 25, though. Is it 50? Yeah. It's currently 50. So the increase is only a $25 increase. Okay. Well, that's, I re I'm probably going back prior to that so it was 25 up to 50 now we're saying 75. could we possibly base that fee on what the cost of the software is divided out among the businesses to keep it as fair as we can to i guess what i recall was having the lower fee was one of the reasons that we used to get the businesses to register. Look, it's only $25, you know, give us your name and, and a contact person, telephone number, so that we can contact you when necessary to let you know if somebody's broken into your building or, or whatever the case may be. And that lower amount seemed to get more cooperation. So I guess what I'm looking at is cover our costs as close as we can in the future. Thank you. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you. Through the chair to Mr. Denault. <laughs> is there a penalty for companies if they don't register? Uh, there is currently a, a penalty that we, I can't think of a time we've ever actually done anything to enforce it. I believe it's a municipal civil infraction to sort of entice uh, them to get, get on the program. Uh, so it'll, be, it'll be similar in the ordinance as far as licensing goes. There will be a penalty in the sense that uh, the business should not be operating without its general business license, uh, just for safety reasons, um, first responder reasons, uh, city database reasons. Um, but I believe we still left it as a municipal civil infraction if, in fact, uh, we need to go to that step. And, and again, I can't think of a time we've ever used that. Okay. Um, I do like that it um, helps our first responders to know exactly what they're walking into if um, there is an emergency on site. Um, you, we've listed in our backup material quite a few other communities that have uh, general business license ordinances. Can you give me an approximate percentage of um, business cooperation in those communities? Unfortunately, I can't. Uh, we, I don't think any of us drilled that deeply to determine how successful their programs are. Uh, the research that we did in the communities that we provided 
range in you know uh, demo demographics from very very small towns to very bustling vibrant towns um, but no we didn't drill that part out okay um, I, I think I'm all set that's all I have thank you mr. Radke thank you mr. mayor uh, I have some questions and I'm I'm not so sure about this ordinance uh, through first mr. Donald stay put but I'm gonna ask Ms. Riska some questions first through the chair to mrs. Riska um, are all businesses required to register or only brick and mortar resident uh, businesses brick and mortar businesses so if I ran like a, a business from my house I wouldn't have to register for this correct yeah, yeah. thank you um, I guess I'm kind of curious uh, through the chair to mr. Denault I know that the law says that a fee can only actually cover costs recovered otherwise it's a tax and a tax would like this would be illegal <laughs> so he can't levy it that way um, but it, reading the the ordinance it says essentially that one if you don't uh, register on time they'll charge you a 10 percent penalty for not registering on time then furthermore it says that uh, you also could have the police or the fire marshal stop your business from operating and that seemed like a heavy penalty for not uh, paying the $75 so I, I found that to be very confusing uh, I just see this as, a, as another one of uh, a solution in search of a problem. I don't feel like we have a, a severe, severe problem. And if, and if they do, I'd love to see the police chief or the fire chief come up here and tell me about the problems that they're encountering with our business community. But it, essentially, this strikes me as a backdoor tax. Uh, I agree with Mrs. Kosky, $25 or $50 or even $30, $40 sounds more reasonable for what essentially is a registration of business directory. Uh, I think requiring a business to pay $75 a year while on the grand scheme, if you're Chrysler Corp, maybe that's not that's not a lot of money at all. But if you're uh, if you're a local, you know, local cafe or something, maybe that that actually ends up feeling like a lot more money. I just um, I'm very unsure about this, and I don't think I'm going to support it going forward. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Mr. Yanez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I I, I do want to respond actually to. Uh, Mr. Radke's, uh, some of Mr. Radke's comments. I can tell you working at the fire department, um, it wasn't uncommon for businesses to wad up a little piece of paper and put it in their lockbox with the names of all the contacts that they, were, that they have in case the fire department or the police department showed up. And quite often uh, they were written in, in, uh, on a piece of paper, an ink pen or pencil. Uh, the contact information was two or three or four people ago. Um, Lock numbers have changed. It was a very chaotic way of trying to keep up with uh, emergency contacts with the businesses. And I think by, and, and I, I appreciate your comments, uh, um, but I can tell you from real world practical application, uh, just using pencil and paper and trying to keep up with this important information has been very difficult. And I think doing something online like this would be very, very beneficial, especially to businesses that, that uh, um, work with hazardous uh, chemicals and materials or, you know, so, those sort of things. So, uh, you know, $75 um, is still a lot of money to me, but I think it's a small price to pay to maintain a system that I think will benefit, benefit the city as well as uh, our emergency responders uh, in, the, in the years to come. So I will support uh, this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yannis. Uh, Mr. Denault, so what is the current... Uh, regulatory scheme in Sterling Heights for business registration. If I own a brick and mortar business um, and I've gotten a certificate of occupancy, am I required every year to pay a fee, $50? No, Mr. Mayor. Uh, right now, the current system is a business registry. Uh, it's on paper. It's provided to the city clerk's office. The city clerk then issues you a certificate. We've probably all seen them. You know, when I go to my local dentist in Sterling Heights, you see it on the wall. It says certificate or a business registration certificate for city clerk tells you when it's valid for. Uh, that is an initial one-time fee when you start up in the city. It helps get the database going and it helps them get the records on file. And then yearly, it's there's no longer a fee. Uh, that is in part because there's no more cost to the city for that process other than issuing a piece of paper every year. Um, the new protocol being proposed involves licensing software that of course uh, is much more complex much more universal in terms of cross communicating between all the departments of the, of the city of Sterling Heights and allowing everybody access to the information necessary for all different reasons when responding to a business so 
Uh, the, that's why the fee structure will look differently in this ordinance than it does in the current system. Okay, and what is the business required to do on an annual basis right now? Currently, they get a renewal from the city clerk's office, and they are required to return that to the city clerk and receive their new certificate to put on the wall. Uh, do you or Ms. Riska have any idea what the uh, compliance rate is on that? Uh, anecdotally, if not, uh, if you don't keep good data on it? Sir, you're asking for the compliance rate for the renewals? Yeah, so like if, if we have a pretty good idea of how many businesses are out there, um, what, what would you say the compliance rate is in terms of businesses sending back that annual uh, registration? So we have about 50%, we, in, we suspect about 50% of our businesses complete the registration first time. And of that 50%, only 50% of that. So 25% overall actually file the renewal. And that is after second and third notices are sent. Okay. And when we're talking about the benefits, you know, so one of the things that I hesitate with is we're talking about all the benefits that businesses will have by doing this. You know, better information for the first responders, you know, better information on road closures and, and, you know, blackouts and things like that. But the businesses are already not finding it to be useful to them because 75% of them don't care. Um, so I'm just always kind of leery of the government coming in and telling businesses, this is for your own benefit, trust us, we know what's best for you. And by the way, uh, we'll take $75 a year or, you know, for providing you this benefit that you didn't ask for. Um, so this is also a little bit awkward because the proposal is, um, is on the agenda later on in a portion that we're not really able to talk about. Um, there's an annual fee of about $40,000, right? So that's what you suspect that the annual fee will be for this software going forward, Ms. Riska? Yes. What other additional fees will there be um, or cost to the city to maintain the software or to, um, to update it? I mean, there, are there going to be manpower costs to the city? Yes, there are going to be manpower costs. We expect or hope to have business surveyors go out, um, you know, maybe on an annual basis, maybe on a biannual basis to survey the, the properties and make sure that we have all of the compliance. Um, additionally, I know we talked about our current registration. We have a one-time fee and then there is not a renewal fee because there's not a, a, a cost to that. And I would actually disagree with that because I have a full-time staff member that is dedicated solely to uh, business registries and specialty licensing. So there, there is um, a cost in just tracking and making sure that um, they're going through the appropriate approval processes. But specialty licenses have a fee associated with them, right? That is correct. Okay. Do you have an estimate of how many businesses there are in Sterling Heights that would be impacted by this ordinance? It would be, well, the guess would be all of them because it would be, it would be, all businesses would be subject to it. So if, if our estimations are correct, um, it'd be around 4,000. Okay, 4,000. I'm not great at math. <laughs> 4,000 times 75 is $300,000. So we've got software fee of $40,000 a year. We've got some inspectors um, and whatnot, but we're, we're looking to raise $300,000 here from the local business community. And I guess I don't, I mean, I'd like to see more of a breakdown of what our actual cost would be. Um, because as Mr. Radke said, if we're just, if we're taking $300,000 for software, it's gonna cost 40,000, have a couple employees. Um, I mean, we're not, we're not hiring new employees, right, to do this? It would be um, temporary, so seasonal temporary. Okay, so we're talking about two part-time employees. 
So I don't, the numbers don't add up to me. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to vote yes on this today because this is an introduction and because it's a two-step process. Um, it comes back for a second reading at the next meeting, the first meeting in, in August. Um, but I have a number of questions that, that I would like to have answered as well. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see, we'll see at the next meeting. Um, okay. Council, without any further discussion, uh, could we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Riska? Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kosky? Yes. Mr. Radke? No. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Rasky? Yes. Motion carries 6 1. Uh, thank you, Ms. Riska. Moving on to the next item on our agenda tonight, which is another ordinance introduction, and this is to consider introduction of an ordinance amending chapter two of the city code of ordinances to create a diversity and inclusion commission. We have a presentation from our community relations director, Melanie Davis, and our assistant city attorney, Don Denault. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening again. Uh, back in 1990, the city's Ethnic Community Issues Advisory Committee was formed with a goal of improving communication and promoting understanding among different ethnic, age, and socioeconomic groups within the city. And for the last 30 years, this group has focused a large amount of their time and effort on events and initiatives that increase awareness and understanding of the cultural differences that make up the fabric of the city of Sterling Heights, while also working to improve understanding and cooperative living throughout our community. So flash forward at the regular city council meeting of February 4th, 2020, uh, Councilman Michael Radke proposed the idea of revising the city's current ethnic community committee to become an official commission that would continue the fine work of the existing committee while also really helping to drive forward the city's 2030 vision for an absolute inclusive community. In the months since, city administration has held internal dialogue as well as conducted research regarding best practices among other communities across the nation <clears throat> for assembling such commissions to advise the city on diversity, inclusion, and equity strategies that strengthen relationships between diverse community groups and city government, as well as foster mutual understanding and respect among all residents. So with that recap, I would like to uh, invite Assistant City Attorney Don Denault back to the podium to share some of the finer points of a proposed ordinance that, if approved, would allow for the creation of a diversity and inclusion commission for the city of Sterling Heights. Hello again, everyone. Um, this is a little bit more of a fun topic in the sense that it's a really good initiative um, that administration is working on right now for your consideration this evening. Um, the idea of a diversity and inclusion commission is remarkably, as we dug into this, um, not as common as you might think yet in 2020. Uh, we were able to find a number of examples nationally about uh, of similar types of boards and commissions that exist that fit the mold of what we think uh, City Council is looking for in terms of evolving our current committee, uh, which, by the way, fun bit of trivia, when it was created, it was entitled the Ethnic Community Issues Advisory Committee. And that was in 1990 by resolution of City Council. <clears throat> it's been known as the Ethnic Advisory Committee or the Ethnic Advisory uh, Community, Ethnic Community Advisory Committee, I believe. Uh, but that is its formal name, Ethics, Ethnic Community Issues Advisory Committee. And its goal, when it was created, was uh, harmonious relationships and open communication with the community. And now, as we bring this ordinance to you to um, evolve this committee into a formal commission that would be etched in the ordinance books, like many of our other commissions, Youth Advisory and Sustainability and Historic, um, the idea behind that formality 
would be to expand its membership and expand its scope and reach. So instead of being strictly dedicated now to the celebration of culture and communication and celebration of that, uh, its reach and its scope would extend into diversity, inclusion, ethnicity, and all human relations. And that's really the common theme that we found when we did find uh, commissions like this that exist throughout the nation, uh, from California to Oregon to New Jersey to Wisconsin, Illinois, Washington, uh, even in Missouri, we found a, a commission uh, called the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force uh, that was created, we believe, way back in 1970, and it's been around that long. Um, and all of them, I think the, the theme behind all of them in their mission statements is to foster mutual understanding and respect among all groups within the city. So with that messaging in mind, uh, the ordinance proposed for introduction this evening, and uh, again, consistent with the city's visioning 2030 plan uh, that is centered on inclusivity, um, the goal of the new ordinance would be to expand the committee into a full-time, a full-blown commission, still an advisory body, uh, but established by ordinance, and expand its membership from its current 11 to 15. Uh, the idea being in the ordinance that the current 11 would retain their positions, should they desire to keep them, at least for now, uh, because their terms are continuing and also allow for four new members to be appointed uh, to grow this particular body. Um, the ordinance would establish officer positions and responsibilities, the usual types of Roberts rules, things that we would expect from our commissions and uh, boards. Uh, the community relations director would be assigned as an advisor and staff liaison, which is already currently the approach and practice um, for this particular committee. Uh, the ordinance would set a goal of meeting at least once a month and presenting to the city council once a year, much like we do with the Youth, youth Advisory Board as well. Um, some of its, I suppose, responsibilities, if you will, uh, it would act in an advisory capacity and make recommendations to the city council and city manager on all matters pertaining to diversity, inclusion, culture, ethnicity, and human relations. Uh, it would research initiatives outside of the city to determine how other communities are addressing diversity and inclusion related issues. It'll identify and assist with and advocate for public interest projects that it deems important to provide a, ben a public benefit for future generations on these topics. And the commission will assist city staff with en engagement on the city's diverse population and offer recommendations for diversity and inclusion uh, types of programming throughout the community. Um, as I mentioned, it's not a unique concept nationwide, but it is relatively difficult to find these. So. Uh, we, we believe we've taken uh, the best approaches throughout the nation as well as in Michigan and combined those to fit uh, what Sterling Heights is and means. And with that, um, we would propose that the ordinance for introduction uh, would allow for this commission to move forward in a way that goes farther than culture, that goes farther than ethnicity into inclusion uh, for all city residents. And with that, we're here for any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Denault. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak on this item? Mr. Jefferson? Yeah. <clears throat> Charles Jefferson. Um, I have a question, a couple questions. Um, What's the difference between this and the, Af the Sterling Heights uh, African American um, Coalition? Um, that's one question. Number two, is this the two step process or is this going to be the one step process? And number three, um, how many cultures do we, or ethnicities do we have here in Sterling Heights? And how do we make sure they all covered um, by this commission? Because he said it's only 15 spots, but I, I gotta pretty well say there's probably way more than 15 um, ethnicities here in Sterling Heights, plus the, the gays, the lesbians, bisexual, transgender people, and it, it's gotta be a host of, of people. Um, is there a new um, term limit for these individuals um, as far as them being on the commission? Uh, is this a mayoral, going to be a mayoral appointment or is this going to be a council appointment? There's, there's a number of questions that 
that need to be asked and, and answered before this, this goes on. Um, I think that's just about it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Is there anyone else? Ms. Katula? Hello, um, Susan Katula from Sterling 5310 Dixon, uh, Sterling Heights. I've been a resident for 33 years and actually on the Ethnic Community Committee uh, for about 15 of those um, those years. And as I'm, as I, as we sat in, in, in our February meeting and we were hearing about changing the name of the, um, of the group, everyone kind of thought, well, I mean, is it because we're not very inclusive? Uh, is it because we are not very diverse and uh, we are diverse, I think. Um, we've had openings, we've had people apply, we've uh, had people join the group. I actually thought Sterling Heights, and I believe Sterling Heights is like very progressive by having an ethnic community committee. And there's such a big difference between race and ethnicity, right? And, and, and this committee, and, and sometimes people don't understand that. Uh, truly. Um, I know um, he just asked how many different ethnic groups we have. I can't really say how many at Sterling Heights, but I sit on the Board of Education and work consolidated schools. And our high school alone, Sterling Heights High School alone, has over 60 different languages that are the first language of their students. So you can just imagine how ethnic we are in the city, right? So the idea of race is color, right? Color of your skin. So if I'm on this committee, I'd probably consider myself white, right? If we're thinking in that manner. Um, but to be ethnic is so, it's, it's very hard to explain to a person that really doesn't, can't um, separate those two, you know, the race and ethnicity. And I was so proud of the city to have an ethnic community committee. And by saying we are, you know, to be on a committee and uh, to be so, um, progressive with inviting everyone and being so diverse. Uh, I think in one way kind of I explain, especially when I speak to um, students, when I'm trying to explain the difference between ethnicity and race, is I tell a little story about Coca-Cola. There was a salesman that went to the Middle East and wanted to sell Coca-Cola, and he wasn't really too um, knowledgeable of the ethnic groups in the Middle East. So his manager told him to, well, if you can't speak the language, then use pictures. So he brought out a picture of a gentleman uh, sitting on a beach, passed out, and um, then put out another picture of the gentleman um, drinking a can of Coca-Cola. And in the third picture, he has the gentleman jumping up for joy after he drinks the can of Coke and came back to the United States and told his manager that I failed in the Middle East, I couldn't sell. And he said, why? It was, they were the most perfect pictures. And he said, well, if I only knew, they read right to left. <laughs> and so the idea is that you really have to understand your ethnicity and the people that live in your city. And I think by, to me, by changing the name, I felt like our committee wasn't inclusive and we are very inclusive. And I just wanted to um, hopefully then I don't know if you're voting on it tonight, but maybe think about it and maybe speak to some of the other members. I came today because I was supporting my colleagues um, on all the uh, census work they did. And not only did they do the census work, but what, maybe what was failed to mention is many of the calls that were made were made in three different languages. Um, and um, we w actually walked people through a lot of the census uh, <clears throat> questions and you know, helped them. I'll vote on that. So I came to support them. And then when I saw this, I wanted to come up and speak. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Katula. I'll take you, Ms. Nevaeh. <laughs> Council, Mayor Taylor, thank you. Uh, you guys may remember me from uh, two meetings ago. I just wanted to come up and um, I, I understand what mes Mr. Jefferson was asking about the two different committees, but I do think it's important that we have a committee here that 
right now in this time in our country that is really focused on the needs of the black individuals in our community, of the African American individuals in our community. But we also need to understand that there's a huge community of LGBTQIA individuals living in Sterling Heights. There are people, there are women that experience discrimination. There are people that experience discrimination just because of their age, right? So like, there's a lot of different intersectionalities that exist in this community. So that's why having a council, or uh, I'm sorry, a committee that is focused specifically on race and ethnicity is definitely needed, but we also need some sort of inclusion council that, that looks at all of these issues um, broadly together. So that's why I would say that there's most definitely space for, for both of these um, committees, councils uh, here in Sterling Heights. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Miss. <clears throat> I'm Jennifer Carberry, resident of Sterling Heights. Um, I would echo her sentiment as well. It's time to move beyond just ethnicity and race and include voices of the LGBTQ community, women, youth, and others. Diversity and inclusion is a broader term that could benefit everybody in our community. Um, hopefully, it doesn't diminish the work that's been done by the ethnic committee, but expands upon it and makes it a more inclusive place for all residents in Sterling Heights. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on this item? If not, council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Resolved to introduce the ordinance amending chapter two of the city code of ordinances to create a diversity and inclusion commission. Support. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion, Mr. Radke? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm so happy to see this come back. Uh, I, I actually asked for this, this to be brought back to council, uh, not only because of what's happened in our country, but I proposed this idea before most of the protests and things that have happened right now. I think I agree with Mrs. Carberry directly that I don't think this diminishes the, the ethnic advisory committee, but it kind of upgrade, upgrades it and expands its role here in Sterling Heights. Uh, the one thing I would add is not just uh, diversity and inclusion, but diversity, equity, and inclusion, because we all have a role to play here in Sterling Heights to make sure we have a more fair and equal society. And I, I commend the Ethnic Advisory Committee for all the wonderful events, the diversity awards, the things that they're already doing that basically this commission now upgrades their job. Instead of it being a resolution, it's now in our ordinances. Instead of it uh, being kind of ad hoc, because they have a diversity awards every year. But that was just kind of established by their by their committee. Let's let's really flesh it out and go a little bit further. And I think that this is the the best way to do it. And I'm I'm wholeheartedly in favor of this. I believe it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be a way for everyone to really have a chance to discuss the issues that face us. And also, it has a reporting function. It comes back to council and makes suggestions to how we can be a more equitable and inclusive place. So I, I look forward to voting yes on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Uh, anyone else, Council? Mr. Yannis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, to uh, Ms. Uh, Davis, Mrs. Davis, I have a question. Yep, Mella. Yes. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Sorry, a surprise. Um, so, can you walk us through a little bit of the process if you if you flesh this out yet in regards to how the commission is going to change, um, what exactly, or how exactly is the process going to work as far as developing the new tasks of this new commission, growing from the committee to the commission, some of the roles and responsibilities that are expanding? What, what kind of walk us through it? Well, I think that, I think in general, you know, a lot of that will come out of the existing and new members of the commission based on what they feel that the city should be doing. However, you know, there may be, um, as, as we've talked about this, that making it a diversity and inclusion commission expands their role and adds uh, groups that are not currently maybe represented on the current committee. Um, groups like, you know, based on LGBTQ uh, identity or, um, you know, disabled individuals, people that have disabilities in our community. And I think if those people get added to the group, 
they may form separate subcommittees that want to work on you know, issues that are very important to their groups. So we don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but I think that you know, if we add the right types of people to that group to really make sure that we're being inclusive on the committee, um, we'll see that there are different things that are important to those groups that, will, that they'll have um, ideas and suggestions of things that they want to see come out of the commission. Did that answer your question? Yeah, so so you, we're, the new commission still has to develop um, goals and objectives, a mission Correct. statement, that whole thing. So we're Correct. starting from scratch. I mean, other than the existing committee members, as Don mentioned, they will retain their positions for the, their current term or whatever if they so choose. But yes, I think that as this group comes together, there will be new, they'll probably take the best of what the committee has done in the past, keep that, and then add on based on what they think their goals and objectives should be for the future. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Koski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Davis? Yes. I was on council back in 1990. When we established this committee, it was to be able to have the opportunity to work with the new immigrants coming to Sterling Heights. The people that uh, English was their second language, if they even learned it, a lot of them did not speak English at all. The committee was formed so that we had different nationalities to help us communicate with the new residents, to let them know what our ordinances were, what our codes, and so on. That's why the TV program was put together, Getting to Know Your Neighbor. That's why the Ethnic Festival, so that they could show their, this is a bad word, show their wares, but to show their, their costumes, their dances, their, their um, formal wear, uh, their native dress, so that we could get to know what they're all about. What kind of food did they eat? What, did, what was their cooking like? What were their arts and crafts? That's what it was all about. This committee that is being proposed is a great committee, but it doesn't belong combined with the ethnic committee. Because when we have our ethnic festival, the five new members, what are they going to do at their table? What are they going to present? What kind of rules or regulations are you going to have? Or, or what kind of qualifications are those five new members going to have? Because we try to pick members of that committee from different nationalities so that we had 11 different languages that were spoken there. We try to keep one of each so that they could be called upon when we needed assistance. So what are the five new members, what are their qualifications going to need to be? I think that the qualifications would be determined by the ordinance. I think that when when we go out, it's, it's like we've talked about when we recruit for other commissions. We've talked about recruiting diverse candidates. And I think that we can do a really good job of reaching out to other groups that we may not have been reaching before in terms of the recruitment we're doing. I don't know that we're gonna specifically cherry pick people for this commission, but I think that we will open it up and let people know that it is a diversity inclusion commission and that we have these various groups that we would like to see represented on the group, including people from the LGBTQ community, people from that have disabilities, people from the disabled community. But at the same time, I don't think that this commission is designed to take away anything from the previous committee. I think we would still like to see all the ethnicities and the cultures that exist on that committee now, we'd still like to see them represented in this new commission. And I think that, uh, like I said before, you may find that as the commission plans out their goals and objectives and their plan of work, you might find that there are some groups, some subcommittees formed, some different groups 
that have very specific interests in mind, but I don't think that we're going to, we don't have any intention of getting rid of what we already have. I think we enjoy some really good ethnic and cultural representation on that group, and I think we would like to see that continue. I don't think we have any plans of getting rid of the cultural exchange, for example. I think that's a great program. It's very, very well attended and it serves a wonderful purpose for our community. I think the role of this commission would be taking all the excellent work and the excellent volunteers that are a part of the existing committee and just expanding that. Well, I believe that they should be kept separate because I love the ethnic festival. I love the diversity dinner. I love what that committee has done. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to see it changed. Yeah, I, I want don't think them that to that continue with the work that they're doing. Right. This new committee that's being proposed, that's a great committee too. But I think they should have 15 members, their own choice, and be inclusive and bring in anybody and everybody that wants to join and let our ethnic committee remain the same. So I cannot support this as written. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Ms. Koski. Council, anyone else? Mrs. Arkham. Mayor Taylor, thank you. Um, you know, some of the questions that I have here are, I have to agree with Mrs. Koski. Uh, right now, I don't have any questions, so if you want to sit down, that's fine. Um, but my first thought, I, I really believe that this, I'm in favor of the committee, but not the way it's being presented to us tonight. I really think it needs to be a committee of its own. And the reason why I say that is in, in the past, we did appoint somebody from the LGBT committee to this ethnic committee, and they felt that the goals were not the same. They're the ones that left the committee because they didn't feel that it was, it, 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 the message wasn't theirs. So that's why I feel that when people brought up tonight gender, age, um, handicaps, um, sexual orientation, yes, I believe that we should have diversity and, and inclusion, but I wanna know why equality is not listed in one of the goals of this commission. I mean, that's left out completely, and I think it's very important. Um, the, I think Mr. Jefferson brought up a good point as to who's going to appoint these new um, commissioners. Um, is this going to be mayoral appointment or is this going to be a council appointment? So I'm in favor of the committee I just don't, I want it separate from the ethnic uh, advisory committees is probably the best thing that I can say. And then um, if this is going to, to be um, a commission, I wanna know if it's gonna be a televised commission. Is it going to be something where uh, residents will be able to learn from whatever this um, committee decides that would make us a better city to live in? So that's something else that I, I would wanna know. So um, today, I would I, I don't approve of it as it sits. Um, so I don't know if we need to uh, bring it back um, another way, or if all these changes could be made before it is actually adopted. So through the chair to Mr. Denault, if he's still here, he's here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell. So. And I don't know what other people are thinking, but like I said, I, the, I think that um, the committee is a good idea, just not the way it's presented tonight with, in conjunction with the ethnic diversity committee, you know, um, ethnic um, advisory committee. I think they need to be separate and for what the goals have been and what the goals are moving, in, you know, in the future. But um, I see that this committee has merit, so, what can we do so that we could possibly have both commissions? What can we do? Mr. Denault. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, absolutely, Ms. Yarko. Uh, it would be a very simple matter for us to redraft or amend this draft to just eliminate the portion that says that the current committee will be reformed. And that would leave the committee in place and it would create a brand new diversity and inclusion commission. It wouldn't take much to, to modify it in that way if that's the will of the council. Because I think it's a good idea. I just think that their goals, and I think, um, I think in some respects it would be different than the ethnic committee. And that's why I think they should have um, their own goals. I th and not only that, um, 
I think it would be a disadvantage for them to come into an existing committee where you've already have 11 people working together and then you're just going to bring, you know, four more in. Um, I think that even if you had um, seven people on this commission to start and maybe nine eventually, I think would be a, a really good idea instead of just having four. So that's my opinion. Um, and not only that, we've talked about it for a long time. I remember um, uh, Mr. Vanderpool bringing this up probably five years ago, that maybe we needed to make some type of changes as, as the world is changing. So um, I'd like to see what we can do moving forward and, and to keep them separate. Nothing further. Thank you, Ms. Sarko. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you. Um, I, I have to agree with Mrs. Kosky. Um, our ethnic committee is a phenomenal group of people and they have worked really hard and really cohesively to help educate all the residents of the city um, about all the different cultures in our community. I also believe that the diversity and inclusion commission is much needed. So I would like to see them separated as well. I think ethnicity and diversity and inclusion um, are, are different, in my opinion. Um, and possibly if you want to give um, the, the opportunity to current ethnic community commissioners um, to sit on the diversity um, and inclusion instead of the ethnic, that they should have the option of one or the other, possibly. Um, but I, I really think they do a good job and I would hate to see some of that, their, their focus um, go by the wayside. They've been in, in, in work together for many, many years and they've done some phenomenal things. Uh, I also believe that this new commission, it, it's a fresh start, it's a new commission. It should be a fresh start. It's not a fresh start if you bring in um, already aligned people with, you know, relationships. I also am qu questioning, there's, there's a lot of unknowns about this commission and we're being asked to vote on it. So I think we need more information on um, the nuts and bolts of this commission, not just what it is going to be addressing. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. All right, thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Mrs. Sorowski. Okay, this is a this is kind of a very it's a it's an interesting topic because we're trying to really promote the inclusion and diversity of our city, and and that is our goal. That is what Mr. Radke's goal was, I believe, when he first proposed this. But we also don't want to force two possibly different, I don't want to say agendas, but focuses, foci, together. The ethnic community, the ethnic commission, committee, really works on promoting and enhancing and educating the rest of the residents on what they have to offer to, the, to everyone. Am I correct, Ms. Cotula? <laughs> At least that's my interpretation of it after living here for 30 years. But we don't, and so their, their focus is, in my observation, that their focus of the Ethnic Committee is to really make sure that we enjoy and see the different aspects. You know, I'm Irish, I love seeing the Irish dancers, I love seeing other dancers from, that we've had them from Taiwan and different places that are just so interesting and different. And they're, they're trying to really bring, not just acceptance, but understanding of their, their views. Diversity right there and inclusion speaks to a group of people who are marginalized in some way, either because of racism or, or and prejudice or they're feeling that they're, you know, as an otherly abled human that they just, the city doesn't meet their needs and they're, the sidewalks are not wide enough or they're not easy to Tra traverse in the winter. Those are completely different issues and, and, and the African American community who has certainly had some major issues coming through. Those are different issues than ethnicity. And I do agree that we, 
it is wonderful, Mr. Radke's proposal, excellent that we definitely need this, but I don't want to meld them together. I don't think that they belong together. Diver diversity, we have said the diversity dinner. We are using diversity now in a little bit different in, uh, flavor with the inclusion and diversity, diversity of the com of different needs and backgrounds. So we, I don't, I agree with my, the ladies. <laughs> I don't mean to have this be the guys against the girls, but I do think that we need to, I want to have both. I want my cake and I want to eat it too. So if Mr. Denault feels that it is easy for us, as he has said, to have both, there's, I don't see any reason why we should have just one. We, and I would like to see, as it has been proposed by um, my other colleagues, nine people, I don't think that four additional members to an ethnic, ethnic committee to make it an inclusive and, di and diversity committee would be right because there's certainly many more issues than that. You know, certainly many more things and more, more people that could uh, get their voice out there. So I'm going to be voting no on this initial proposal and then I would like to find a way to maybe amend that we can bring a new proposal to uh, have two. Is that a possibility through the chair to Mr. Kaszubski? Well, Mr. Kaszubski, I think Mr. Denault already answered that, though. Well, I'm talking about a new, another motion, not an ability to. I'm sorry, say that again? I was talking about making another motion as opposed to asking about the feasibility. Oh, um, Mr. If Kaszubski. If, is that even necessary to do if we vote this down? So because this is a two-step process and it's an introduction, what we normally do in situations like this is we take council's feedback and depending on the uh, consensus of council and, and what direction we uh, perceive we've been given, we go back, we make amendments and we bring back uh, a proposed new version. version for okay. adoption. Okay, then great. Then I don't need to make a second motion. <clears throat> so I'm gonna be voting down the initial proposal as is with the recommendation that we come back to uh, city administration with something a little bit equal. Just to clarify, so purposes, for the purpose of the introduction, you would wanna vote uh, if you want this to move forward in the form that as it, is. Uh, it is, as an introduction phase, we would mm -hmm. uh, vote on the introduction, have it introduced, we would bring it back in the next council meeting with revisions that we think council may. Approve. So if we want, so let me be clear, if we want revisions, we vote yes. If we like the, the idea of the diversity committee, <clears throat> but if we vote, so that's what I need to know. It depends on the consensus of council. Okay. Uh, I, I, I leave it to you on how you're gonna vote, but. Uh, the idea would be that we will take your comments back and draft uh, um, something that addresses the concerns of council as a whole. Okay. Clear as mud. Thank you. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarco. Is, would be appropriate to postpone <clears throat> this introduction for till the next meeting, have the revisions made that you heard tonight so that, is it easier to do that and point just? Of, point of order, Mr. Mayor. Okay, hold, hold on a second, Mrs. Zarko. Mr. Radke, your point of order. You haven't spoken yet and she's speaking twice. Thank you for that, Mr. Radke. Ms. Zarko, you can continue. Oh, um, and that's just, that was what I'm asking. Would it be easier for administration to go and um, if we postpone this tonight for two weeks and then bring it back with the suggestions that we've made? That's my only question, that rather than. Thank you, Mrs. Marco, no. for that oh, Okay, Mr. Kashubsky, uh, I'll let you answer, but my, I feel you already have been asked that question and answered it, and and I, I don't think it's clear as mud. I think it's it's crystal clear. This is the same process that we've used for decades, long, at least as long as I've been on the city council. Um, I did it one agenda item ago. I was not in favor of the agenda item previously presented to us, but since it's a two-step process, I voted yes. The city administration received my feedback. I will provide them more feedback. And then whether or not it's, it's, it's included in the next revision will be the determining factor in whether I vote yes or vote no on it. Voting yes today does not create this commission. Voting yes today moves this forward and gives us the ability to make amendments. It's no different than what we do during the budget process. We, we, we introduce the adoptions ordinance and we make changes to it, and then at the final budget hearing, we adopt the budget. So I think that the process is clear. It's been something that we've used for decades, and I think that we should stick with it. I don't, I'm not interested in 
entertaining a motion to postpone this item because it doesn't give any direction to the city administration. Giving, it would come back in the exact same form in two weeks, so we'd be no better off. I, I say we vote on this, and every council member is free to vote their conscience in whatever way they choose, um, but that's, that's my recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me talk. And then um, since this is something where things have changed a little bit, uh, we'll, we'll have a brief follow up for any council member if you're interested. Um, I'm sensitive to the idea that this is introducing a new uh, mission to a long and well established uh, committee that's done great work for the last 30 years. Okay. And you know, as we've been talking and focused these last uh, few weeks or month on uh, increasing volunteerism and increasing opportunities for people to volunteer, I certainly don't want to take any action that frustrates people who have been volunteering for the past uh, several years or, or even several decades. With that being said, uh, I don't see the need for having two commissions here or committees with such similar missions and objectives. I think that this, the mission of the Ethnic Community Committee can be forwarded and can be continued under a new name with additional members and with an increased scope and an increased mission. I've heard the arguments from my colleagues up here today, um, but I, I don't think that it's really necessary to have two commissions here. I think it would be perhaps um, having one larger commission with subcommittees might be a way of resolving that. Now, Mr. Mr. Denault, or I guess Mrs. Uh, Davis, when the Two members of the Youth Advisory Board were here earlier. They spoke about creating subcommittees or having subcommittees. Is that something that was originally created as part of their charter? I don't believe it was. Is it, it was something not. that they're coming up with on their own? That is correct. It was not originally part of the commission or the board. They decided to do that based on their scope of work, which was four different focus areas. Okay. And do you have any um, idea? And I, I only... I. I don't see Ms. Russo in the audience anymore, so she might know better, but do you know how they're going to create or how they're going to appoint members to those subcommittees? Um, what they have done in their meetings is they have based it on the interest of the board members. So the board members, you know, they, they kind of as a group developed these four focus areas and then they were allowed to choose which focus area they were the most passionate about and then they broke it up in that manner. Okay. You know, I, I think that that might be a, a way that this could work, um, that, that you could have, you know, having 15 members of the Diversity Inclusion Commission. You know, I've heard, well, wh what, if, what are we doing about equality? What are we doing about, um, what do, you know, one speaker said that there's this opportunity right now um, to create the African American Task Force. Maybe that could be rolled into the umbrella of the Diversity Inclusion Commission. But I don't know that just having two is the right answer. Um, so I would like there to just be one. I'd like the scope to be expanded, but I would like to also create the opportunity for the people who are part of the Ethnic Community Committee right now to continue to focus on that mission and focus on that goal of of having, um, celebrating the, the many different ethnicities that are here in the city of Sterling Heights. And I mean, I think that's sort of the point of what, why the city administration at Mr. Radke's request brought this to have an inclusive commission. And it sort of goes against the spirit, in my opinion, of what we're trying to do here to say, well, we don't want to be part of any group that's going to be focusing on LGBT, or we don't want to be in part of any group that's focusing on uh, African American issues, or we don't want to be part of a group that's focusing on, you know, inclusiveness for people with with 
disabilities. So to me, I think that's what, that's the policy that I want to put forward, that we're going to have a commission that takes all of those differences and, and celebrates all of them and works to have more inclusion, equity, uh, better understanding of different cultures, races, religions, skin colors, backgrounds, you name it, everything. So that's, that's my opinion on it. So I'm gonna be voting yes. And I think that um, I encourage the other council members to vote yes and give the administration a couple weeks to come up with something that we can either vote yes or no on in two weeks. So that's, that's, those are my comments and I'll open it up for brief second uh, statements if anybody has any. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanna commend you for your, your talk there, Mr. Mayor. I think you put it better than I could have what the, what the focus of this committee is. I don't think we're trying to, to destroy or stop the Ethnic Advisory Committee but I think having two committees or a commission and a committee that do the same exact thing is uh, contrary to our goals. The Ethnic Advisory Committee already does a diversity award. And I think the, the you know, the Diversity and Inclusion Commission, that would be something that they would be focused on. So having two committees or commissions that are at odds with each other in the city, I don't think that that is a positive development. And I, I, I appreciate what, what uh, Mrs. Kosky said, which is the idea of this committee is getting to know your neighbors. And I, I fully agree, but I think we can get to know our neighbors even better than just based on ethnicity. I think we can, get, we, can, we can get to know our neighbors based upon any number of factors that make up how they live their lives in our city every day. And we've come a long way from 1990. I think we have a long way still to go, but I think that the creation of this commission with subcommittees, which I assume would happen anyways, would be the best in the best interest of the city. That's why I'm gonna vote yes. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yanis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I think this is probably one of the most important things that this council could have done in a long time, uh, inclusion diversity uh, committee. Um, I, I am extremely disappointed that this came to us tonight in this, uh, in this form, in this manner. I would have expected a more complete uh, document, a uh, more complete ordinance. Yeah, not all the ordinances we get are, are perfect and sometimes we, we uh, pass it on the first time and, and fix it uh, before we vote on a second time, but um, this isn't even close, not even close. And I think when we uh, create this commission, this commission, um, we need to get it right, and we need to get it right the first time. And the gentleman sitting in the audience just stands up and he asks six or seven questions that nobody has the answer to. And we're supposed to vote on this thing tonight. We need to get this right the first time. Not two weeks from now when somebody does a rewrite. When this was brought up back in February, one of my concerns was, and, and we'll keep in mind that an advisory committee is exist at the, at the will of the council, right? They're advising us, the city council. And if we don't feel that we need them anymore, you know, we end the committee. But now we're putting this down in, in, in an ordinance, in law. And we don't even know what, the, what their mission statement is or what, 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 what their goals and objectives are. Um, I, I agree with you, Mr. Mayor. I think that the, the uh, Ethnic Advisory Committee could be a subcommittee of, of this group. But you know, one of the things I was concerned about when this was brought up back in February is did we talk to the people who sit on the committee that put years of work into this and did we ask them how they feel about it? Do they wanna be rolled into this? Do they wanna stay separate? Do we feel that they need to stay separate? Ms. Katula got up and talked about it. I, I, doesn't sound to me like she's very supportive. But yet, she's gonna be one of the, the X number of members that are initially gonna be put on this thing and they're supposed to figure out what they're going to do after we pass this ordinance. This is not thought out well. This is not worthy of our time tonight. This needs to come back to us. This is too important, too important for us to, to create this ad hoc workshop on a, on a commission that's going to help guide the city for the next 20, 30 years. So while I, I agree that this is very important, I agree with 
just about everybody at this table and their arguments, I don't agree that we need to vote on this tonight. I think the city needs to come back with a more complete ordinance, more thought out ordinance presented to us. So I, Mr. Mayor, I'm gonna make a motion to table this for four weeks or two meetings and this give the city an opportunity to come back with a more complete ordinance, a more well thought out ordinance and a better presentation. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to table. I support that. It's been moved and supported. Uh, Mr. Kashubsky, the motion to table this is on the floor. Is this a debatable motion? It, it sounds it, to me like it's a motion to postpone to a date certain. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, it is a motion to postpone to a date certain. A table would be required to come back at this meeting. So you are asking for a motion to postpone to a date certain, and that is debatable. You're good. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not uh, up on my Roberts rules like I should be, but okay, uh, a motion uh, to po postpone for a date certain. Four weeks, Do I next. need to mention the date? Well, you can say at the at two council meetings from now would be fine. In two council meetings from now. That's my motion. Thank you, Mr. Kupchewski. And I support that. Thank you. Uh, the motion is to postpone to the second meeting in August. In August, yes. That is a postponement to a date certain, which is non-debatable. No, that is debatable. It's debatable. No. Mm -mm. Motion to postpone is debatable under your rules. Not to a date certain. We've always operated that postponement to a date certain not is a non-debatable motion. Now, let me look that up for you real quick. <laughs> I'm for, I, I may be incorrect, but let me check. We'll take a moment to uh -huh. confirm. I am corrected. I'm sorry. The motion to postpone indefinitely would be debatable. The motion to postpone to a date certain is not. You are correct. Okay. With no discussion, um, the motion is to postpone to the second meeting in August. It's been supported. Ms. Riska, can we please have a roll call vote? Mrs. Yarko? Yes. Mrs. Kosky? Yes. Mr. Radke? No. Mrs. Schmidt? Yes. Mrs. Saraski? Yes. Mayor Taylor? No. Mr. Yanez. Yes. Motion carries 5-2. Uh, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda tonight, which is an ordinance adoption. And this is to consider adoption of an ordinance amending zoning ordinance number 278 to add article 14B, creating a traditional mixed use development node district overlay district. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? If not, council, we need a motion. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Resolve to adopt the ordinance amending zoning ordinance number 278 to add article 14B, creating a traditional mixed use development node district, TMUDN overlay district. Support. It's been moved and supported. Uh, is there any discussion, Mrs. Schmidt? Uh, Mayor Taylor, I think Mr. McLeod explained this very well at our last meeting, so I have no further discussion. Okay. Mrs. Zarko, anything? Nothing, thank you. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I fully support this. I just wanted to uh, go further and uh, ask Mr. McLeod to really consider the 16 mile and chainer intersection as a part of this district, especially because we have buildings there that have been vacant for some time. I think that they could use some redevelopment. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Radke. Council, any further discussion? With no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on any item on tonight's consent agenda? <coughs> if, uh, if not, um, with the consent of my colleagues, 
for a very brief suspension of our rules. I'd like clarification before we uh, vote on this. Consent agenda item G is the proposal regarding the um, business licensing registration. Is it, is it your opinion, Mr. Kaszubski, that this contract is dependent on the ordinance passing or is this contract not dependent on the ordinance passing? If council does not ultimately approve the ordinance, we will not be moving forward with this contract. While you will have approved it, if you would like to make it, uh, we, we would have to pull this off the consent agenda, take it under consideration item and amend it if you'd like to say contingent upon uh, just, ultimate passing. Just, or we just could to be clear this. though, we're not moving forward where we would be approving the contract, which is a different thing entirely than signing the contract. Is, and that's your understanding? That's yes. what your, that's your advice. Okay, I'm comfortable leaving it on the consent agenda, but I'd, yeah. I'd welcome any colleagues of, on the council who would wanna remove that item. Hearing none um, and having no per audience participation, council, we need a motion. Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Support. It's been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Next item on our agenda is to consider nominations to the city of Sterling, to consider a nomination to the city of Sterling Heights Zoning Board of Appeals. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? Yes, I'll take you, ma'am. Sorry, I'm short. My name is Kelly Skillen, and I'm a resident and business owner in Sterling Heights. I'm here today because I'm both appalled and dismayed at some of what happened at the last meeting. When we moved to Sterling Heights, we came from a much more diverse community. Friends cautioned us about Sterling Heights checkered past, and we reassured them that it was a changing community. We've seen those changes on our block and in our neighborhood, and I believe diversity strengthens our community, and I hope you do too. But as my grandfather used to say, actions speak louder than words. I could stand up here and provide you with numerous studies that demonstrate the value of diversity, particularly in small groups. I could offer you data that concludes that just being around people that are different than you causes a change in your perceptions and worldviews, even without any conscious awareness that that change is occurring. And I could offer you snippets of conversations that I've had with my neighbors and friends that indicate that they also understand and value diversity in this community. And you all certainly seem to recognize that when you point out that voters elected four women to the council, but again, actions speak louder than words. And honestly, I'm not here to scold you for what the words you used. I'll leave that to the media and Facebook. But I've seen a number of claims by council members of the inability of the city to recruit a diverse group of volunteers. I've heard the equivalent of people throwing up their hands in the air and saying there's nothing we can do. But there's always an action that can be taken, so I'm here to offer a few. First, make volunteer recruitment a priority. In 2009, Iowa passed a resolution requiring all governmental boards be gender balanced from the state to the local level. While I'm not suggesting a similar mandate be done here, City leadership could certainly take a more active and stronger role in making volunteer recruitment a priority. As one resident said, what if the city put as much marketing into boards and commissions as they did for the census? Two, limit the number of boards and commissions a resident can serve on. A resident member of the planning commission claimed that 114 people currently fill 142 board positions. That's shameful. Limiting people to one board would effectively force the issue and not allow future members of city council to fall back on the same people who are already volunteering. Three, 
Make sure the website provides current and relevant information. The city has improved its website since I've moved here and includes a decent amount of information about boards and commissions. But outside of planning and zoning board of appeals, there is little information about the process. I know it's a rolling application, but offering information about when appointments are usually considered would help residents know when they need to apply. Show the website and any written materials to a variety of audiences and ask for their input. If they were considering volunteering, does it have the information that they'd like to see? Maybe they'd like to see it accessible in other languages. I know I'd like to know how long a board appointment is for before I apply to serve. Four, use your networks to actively seek volunteers. All of the volunteer management literature will tell you that few people volunteer without being asked. And yet, most people volunteer. Why? Because someone took the time out to tell them about the opportunity and suggest that they be good at it. The city, from the leadership to the staff to the volunteers, needs to be out there promoting these opportunities. This is not a one-person or one-office responsibility, but rather everyone's responsibility. And those responsibilities begin with you. You are the democratically elected leaders of one of the largest cities in the state of Michigan. You are the ones we have chosen to represent us. You set the tone and the agenda. As much as we as residents can make our voices heard, you are ultimately the ones whose actions will speak louder than words. Diversity matters, representation matters, and inclusion matters. Make your actions speak louder than your words. Thank okay, you. thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Didn't recognize you, Mr. Kirby. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> I, I didn't look at your hat. <laughs> I hope I'm following the right protocol here. Um, good evening, members of council, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Kaszewski, and Mr. Van. Well, I just wanted to drop by tonight. As you can see, I've been out doing certain things tonight. Uh, there's nobody here, I don't think, who is a bigger proponent of volunteerism than I. Um, I love the ability that I have to donate my time to the city. I feel like I'm making a difference. I am the originator of that number of 114 people serving in 142 positions. I believe that is to be, I believe that is correct within plus or minus two or three. Um, we really, really have to work harder and longer at attracting new volunteers to this city. Um, we had a volunteer fair uh, a couple of years ago. Mr. Vanderpool worked in concert with uh, the uh, lady that occupied Mrs. Hughes' position at the time. It came off wonderfully. Uh, the second one, not so much. I would like to see that come back with a vengeance. The first one was very successful. And uh, I would like to encourage my fellow residents to get out, find out what the opportunities are for volunteering in Sterling Heights. They are life-changing. They've changed my life. They've made me a better person. And uh, I hope that uh, we can work together as a city to bring more people in. My personal belief is the more volunteers we get, the more diversity we'll get. The diversity will come from bringing in more volunteers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garropy. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Carol Chi. I live on Moravian and Sterling Heights, and I wanted to uh, talk about the same issue. Um, I was very disappointed to hear how people voted two weeks ago uh, for Mr. Hansinger. I'm thinking, you had no other person to vote for. However, that's not true. There was a female that you could have voted for that was a diverse person that was a person of color, a different ethnicity. You could have voted for that was highly qualified. And especially after I heard what he wrote to the free press, I think it was, and to say that that was an opinion, that was no opinion, and COVID is science. That's a fact. Doesn't matter what you believe, it's not a religion, it's science. I know, I taught science, and you should believe that, understand that. So I want to talk about defining implicit bias. We, uh, implicit bias is something, is a term that I learned just rarely, rec fairly recently, some of you may have not even heard of it. But I looked it up, I thought, inherent bias? Was that what it was? No, it's implicit bias. 
It refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. Unconscious. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control, residing deep in the subconscious. These biases are different from known biases that individuals may choose to conceal for the purpose of social or political correctness. Rather, implicit biases are not accessible through introspection. The implicit associations we harbor in our subconscious cause us to have feelings and attitudes about other people based on characteristics such as race, ethnicity, age, appearance. These associations develop over the course of a lifetime, beginning at a very early age through exposure to direct and indirect messages. In addition to early life experiences, the media and news programming are often cited origins of implicit associations. There are a few characteristics of implicit bias. They're pervasive. Everyone possesses them. Everyone on this earth possesses them. Even people with avowed commitments to impartiality, such as judges. You might have heard some judges' decisions and point thought... No, you don't call points of order. Implicit... You do not call points of order. You, out of order. In fact, Mr. Jefferson, you are out of order. Thank you, so thank you for your... Uh, I'm allowing her to speak on this item, and I believe it is within the bounds of what is germane to this topic. Everybody knows it's germane to this topic. You may continue, Ms. Chief. Mr. Jefferson, you can wait for your turn, okay? You can wait for your turn. Go ahead, Ms. Chief. Thank you for understanding. Uh, they're related, but uh, implicit and explicit biases are related, but they're distinct but mental constructs. They do not necessarily align with our declared beliefs. We could say, oh, I'm not racist, I'm not biased, I believe everything is equal, I believe everybody's equal already, and that's not the case necessarily because of implicit bias that everyone possesses. We often favor our own in-group, our own group of people. But they are malleable, they are changeable, you can learn, okay? And the reason I say this, so that people in decision-making roles must consider implicit bias and make a conscious effort to begin including people on city commissions from all races, religions, ethnicities, and genders. Implicit bias, this is a science. It's been studied. I have a few copies here. I can leave them with you for the members of the board. I think I'm, I was trying to make 15 copies. I think I got 10. My computer is kind of old, my printer and all that. So I made copies of this first page. It's by the Kerwin Institute, which is has done a huge scientific study, and that's in, o in OSU, Ohio State University. It's science, not an opinion, but rather a fact. And I say that we need this. We need to consider implicit bias, and there's implicit bias training. They're talking about it in many, in many places now. In many governmental, like federal, the federal government, they think that they need implicit bias uh, training so as not to make mistakes in zoning and planning, as happened before. <laughs> with the acceptance of the 100 decibel concerts at Freedom Hill. Concerts are fine, but 100 decibels, when the planning commission only had to go next door to the library and look up, what's 100 decibels? What does that do? But they let it go. I know because I taught science. I came and spoke about it. And now we are going to have to have that for the rest of our lives, according to the federal judge. The Kerwin Institute strives to provide innovative, compelling, and strategic research to both academic audiences and broader community. You might ask, well, who the heck's the Kerwin Institute? Much of their research is applied and policy-oriented, providing informed, I'm sorry, informed direction and assistance to social justice advocates, communities, funders, and policymakers like you. All right, Ms. Chi, that's, uh, that's your four minutes of time. So I, thank you for your comments. Appreciate thank you so much. I appreciate you listening. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on uh, this item? Mr. Jefferson. <clears throat> Carol Jefferson, Sterling Height. Um, you're telling me you're going to have to explain what did that have to do with the consideration of the nomination of the Sterling Heights uh, Board of Appeals? That had nothing to do with that. Um, 
Now let's get down to the, the talk about the nomination. Um, I've asked this question no less than two dozen times over the years. Since this is the two-step process, how do us residents know the questions that are being asked to the candidates and where do we find the answers to the, from the candidates? Are we going to treat this, start treating this as a, a Supreme Court nomination? We need to have them come down here just like we do when uh, people get appointed to council so we can meet them because they represent us. They don't represent you, they represent us. And we need to know those answers to, uh, to the question. Now, the second part of my question is, now how do we know this is on the up and up now? After the last meeting and what transpired between over this, well, we'll say the last month, how do we know that this nomination right here is now on the up and up? Because we had a person at the last meeting who got appointed, got nominated, got appointed, and he felt so ashamed that he had to withdraw his, uh, his name from it. It wasn't because he was a bad person. It wasn't because of whatever he said about the COVID, because he could say whatever he felt like about the COVID. That didn't mean he didn't have anything to do with, with the job that was at hand. So I just, I just wanted those questions answered, and they need to be answered tonight about this. And like I said, that last lady, I don't know why you didn't ring her out of order, because she didn't talk about this subject, not at all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Anyone else on this item? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Again, Jennifer Carberry. Um, I was raised in Sterling Heights and came back 17 years ago to raise my family here. And I'm proud to say that I'm raising my children in a community that's much more diverse than the community I grew up in in the 80s, to date myself. But having an increasingly diverse community requires that we have leadership, policies, and discussions that reflect that diverse community. Uh, a wise person I saw online, Dr. Skillen, pointed out that diversity is having different people at the party. Inclusion is talking to them and getting to know them and learning more about them. So it's not just having a black person on the Zoning Board of Appeals to have a black person because we have black people that live in the city of Sterling Heights. It's listening and hearing their unique perspective, a different point of view. It's not asking them to represent everybody who's black in our community but it's bringing a different perspective to an all-white, all-male committee. It's one of the only decision-making bodies in the city, besides city council, I think there's two commissions that are decision-making bodies. Having different voices at that table is essential to be making decisions that reflect and represent and stand for what our fine city stands for. So I thank you for the work you've done to make me proud to live here and raise my children here, but a lot has changed in the 40 years and our policies, discussions, direction should change with it. So I encourage you to find more diverse candidates to fill the pool or to have a more diverse pool of applicants, hopefully qualified individuals, but it can't just be all white men making decisions for our city. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else under this agenda item? If not, uh, this is uh, a nomination to the Zoning Board of Appeals, one vacancy, City Council appointment to a term ending June 30th, 2023. Is there anyone who has an appointment? Mr. Mayor. Mayor Taylor. Uh, Mr. Yenez. Um, Mr. Mayor, I uh, resolve to nominate Aisha, sorry, Aisha Faruqi for consideration as an appointee to the Zoning Board of Appeals at the August 5th, 2020 regular City Council meeting. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion, Mr. Yanis? 
No, no. I got it. No, I have no discussion at this time. Thank okay. You. Mr. Radke? Sure, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> I believe Aisha, Aisha, or Aisha, I don't know how to say it right, would be a, a wonderful addition to the Zoning Board of Appeals. She is an attorney. She's already served on our ordinance uh, Board of Appeals. She contacted me because she's going to have to resign that position because she got a new, a new uh, job as an attorney and she can't make the 3 p.m. meeting. She's interested in moving up and serving, and this is an issue that she works on and she's fascinated with. I believe she would be an excellent nominee. She's already served a year on the OBA, just for the record. Thank you, Mr. Radke. Anyone else, Council? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarko. First of all, I don't know the nominee, but I have to tell you that um, this particular nomination and our process has been beat up so badly here at the council meeting on social media that I feel that if we're looking for diverse candidates, we need to um, make sure that we have a large pool of candidates to choose from. So I, my personal feeling is after uh, what happened at the last meeting, um, we had a volunteer Volunteer got abused both here, which was, I think, ridiculous. Um, it was rude and, um, you know, caused him to say that, you know, he doesn't want to volunteer for us. So I personally would like to see some of these um, nominations for these commissions be postponed for 90 days until all of this cools down. We do exactly what everybody's asking us to do is go out there, get a diverse group of people that are interested in this commission or any other commission. So then when we make these appointments, um, we have a large pool to choose from. And that's all I'm gonna say. Because tonight, um, I'm not sure I could vote to approve this tonight. And it's not the person, it's just the process that we've been put in, the embarrassing situation the city's been put in and the inaccuracies of everything that's been on social media about this process. So um, I'm really disappointed in some of the people that even spoke tonight it was certainly different than getting beat up on uh, social media when they really, everything was inaccurate. So um, uh, th that's all I have to say. Um, I agree that if you want these committees to be diverse, we need to have to, a pool of people to choose from. So I think it should be postponed for 30, 90 days. Council, anyone else? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. So when this came before us um, originally, Mr. Hansinger and the other female candidate that keeps getting referenced were not the only two candidates. We had a list of candidates, just to be perfectly clear. Now we have a list of 38 candidates and I'm not comfortable, I have not been able to vet all the new candidates and I appreciate all, all the new applications that we've received. But I need more time to vet some of these new candidates and I would absolutely be in favor of postponing this nomination. I think um, we need to get it right and um, I would be willing to support a motion if Mrs. Ziarko made it to, to postpone this. Um, you know, everybody, it's been said, you have to consider all races, religions, sexes. Our applications don't tell us any of that information. None of it. So you've also asked us to revamp our application and our process. So how can we pick someone without us revamping that process? So um, I need more time to vet all these new applications. And I think that it doesn't put the city in a bad position to postpone this, this um, appointment tonight. So that's all I have, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Council, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Koski. I agree with my colleagues. I would like to postpone this also. Listening to the audience tonight, that we need to enhance our volunteer, our, our list of candidates for this. 
I found one just going back and I told Mr. Mayor Taylor about the person and he said, is it male or female? I don't know because I can't tell by the name. I need to call that person. They sounded like they would be well qualified for the board. But I agree, we need a larger list of candidates. And the only way we're going to get that is if we say, if you're sitting out there in the audience and you want to serve on this particular board, take out your, your iPad, your, your computer, your phone, make your application. It's there on the city website and see if maybe you can serve on that board. So I would be in agreement to postpone this for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever it takes to enhance our list of candidates for the position. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Koski. Anyone else on council, Mrs. Mayor Strowski? Tom. While I do truly appreciate my colleagues and the under, uh, taking to heart what they've heard and their feeling that we need to postpone, we have a list of 38. That, and I think the issue was really stirred up. Obviously, we haven't had this many people in our audience in the, in, for two straight meetings ever, at least since I've been on council. I don't want to say ever because we have had a couple of big attended meetings, but on a regular basis, unless it was a really, really volatile issue. That being said, we do have a large candidate pool. I know quite a few of those people, the, the people on this list that I'm looking at right now in front of my face. I do, and I did speak to Aisha Faruqi, and I do believe that she would be an excellent candidate. She's been put through the ringer a little bit too with all of this, so I, and I do appreciate her uh, willingness to serve. Yes, we need a great, greater, larger pool of people. Right now we are starting with what we've got. We have a good pool. Let's work with what we have and then continue to, in, uh, to, continue to invite, continue to attract, continue to advertise what we have, when we have the appointments, when we have the nominations, what these committees and commissions can do for us and can, can help the residents. So I am going to, I am in support of let's get this, let's get the ball rolling by starting with this nomination. So I do support Aisha Faruqi for this nomination. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Uh, Sorowski. Um, I'm opposed to having any sort of a postponement on this. I, I think that this is an issue that needs to be resolved tonight and be put to rest. Um, I'm glad Ms. Schmidt did mention that, you know, somehow, what, somehow issues like this, they take on a life of their own. And, um, and what the facts are sometimes get lost because people are obviously and understandably uh, emotional about an issue that's hit so close to home for them. At the June 16th meeting, which was, I believe, the meeting that Mrs. Zarco nominated Mr. Hansinger, because at the July 7th meeting would have been the following meeting where he was appointed, there were by my count, 37 applicants for the Zoning Board of Appeals. And a number of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, list it as their number one choice. Um, from that, there's at least two females. There are a number that listed as their second or third overall choice. And there are a number of diverse candidates at that time. So. Somehow this idea perpetuated that there was only one person or maybe one or two people who had applied. You know, we, we do have for particularly the Planning Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals, we do have a pretty wide group of people who have already shown interest in that. I don't think a postponement to 90 days is going to create any, any uh, is, the, is going to be advantageous here if the point is to create a pool of qualified applicants that better represents the community, I would say we already have that right now. And we have an applicant, a nominee, who has been put forward by Mr. Yanez, 
that's qualified and would add diversity to the board. So I'm going to support her nomination tonight and I encourage my colleagues on the city council to, to do so as well. So without any further discussion, Ms. Riska, could we please have a roll call vote on the nomination? Mrs. Kosky? No. Mr. Radke? Yes. Mrs. Schmidt? No. Mrs. Sarosky? Yes. Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mr. Yanez? Yes. Mrs. Yarko? No. Motion carries 4-3. Uh, the nomination will move forward to the next city council meeting. Next item on our agenda is to consider appointments to various boards and commissions. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? Mr. Jefferson. Um, I would like to know what are the qualifications for being on boards and commissions other than just uh, being a resident for one year and a registered voter? Because Mayor Taylor just said that the young lady, she was qualified, but that means everybody's qualified. So um, what are the additional qualifications? And then again, if any of this is a two-step process, where can we find out the information on the candidates and the questions that was asked? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Anyone else on this item? Yes, miss. <clears throat> Hi, um, Brandy Wright. I'm a resident of Sterling Heights. I just wanted some clarification. Um, someone on Facebook the other day said that after an application is submitted, it um, doesn't actually, it gets held for three weeks and then doesn't get to you guys um, until after that. So I was just wondering if that's the case. Um, if so, I think a large number of us who have applied in the last couple of weeks, myself included, wouldn't be considered for some of these positions that are coming up. Um, I also wanted to say that, per sorry, perhaps just to um, make sure everybody in the city becomes aware of these positions, you know, we all get tax bills, we all get water bills every quarter, maybe putting a flyer or something in, just reminding people that the volunteer positions are available. That way everybody knows about them. Thank you. Yes, Miss in the back. So it's been brought up multiple times that we need to make the information about how to apply, when to apply, and what the qualifications are clearer and more accessible. For myself, um, I was here two weeks ago. I spoke. I was uh, asked to apply for a commission or for a committee, and I knew that I hadn't lived here long enough to apply. However, I did some research, and now I'm confused because I moved to Sterling Heights in January. I changed my address to vote a week ago. So do I ha now have to wait a whole nother year because I just changed my address officially a week ago? Or can I show some order, other sort of documentation to prove that I was a resident since January? These kind of questions need to be like clearly outlined so that people know how and when to apply for the boards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll get that question answered for you. Anyone else on this item? If not, uh, Mr. Kaczewski, my sense is that if you, you have to be a resident, it's from the time you become a resident, not when you change your address. Would you agree? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, um, there are a number of, let me, let me make sure I pull it up. So there are, are uh, several boards and commissions that are open or have appointments tonight. The first is the Corridor Improvement Authority. This is a mayoral appointment to a term ending June 30th, 2024. I had a candidate who I would like to nominate um, or appoint tonight, um, but there are a number of, there are some issues with this board. Corridor Improvement Authority, uh, based on its charter, requires 
there to be a certain number of business owners and a certain number of residents. Um, there has to be a majority of business owners. There has to be at least one resident. There's one vacancy. The vacancy must be filled by both a resident of the corridor and a business owner in the corridor, which is difficult um, to, to appoint because we don't have anybody that is qualified um, to answer your question. That's one. And, and Mr. Jefferson, I, you know, some of the boards have those technical requirements. Um, others don't, and the qualifications are just based on whatever the city council determines is, uh, makes them qualified. So, so we're going to have to pass on this one. And in fact, uh, like we've done at prior meetings, you know, Mr. Vanderpool, do you have any recommendation on, or Mr. Kashupski, on when we should, when we should postpone this to, and, um, you know, I don't want it, I don't want it to just keep coming back. Do you have any, any uh, guidance you can Mayor, give Mayor, my thought on this is a 60-day a postponement would be in order. As you mentioned, uh, the Corridor Improvement Authority is uh, structured based on a, a state statute. Uh, so we're governed and restricted uh, by a number of state statute provisions. Um, as you mentioned, uh, this is a seven-member board. The last appointment here with this vacancy is really tough to fill. And this may require an ordinance amendment, which we have to study a little further. We have the ability uh, pursuant to state statute to go up to nine uh, commission members or, or authority members. Uh, so we're gonna study that and see if that might be beneficial. And I think 60 days would be appreciated. Okay, 60 days. Uh the second meeting in September uh, puts us actually in less than 60 days. But so why don't we go, why don't uh, we do this? I would entertain a motion to postpone this item to the October 6th, 2020 city council meeting. Support, or I'm sorry, so moved. Support. It's been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. Thank you council for that. Next is the local development finance authority. This is a mayoral appointment. Two open terms, uh, partial terms, one ending June 30th, 2021, and one ending June 30th, 2023. Uh, to the term ending June 30th, 2023, I would uh, appreciate a council member who would make the appointment of Jeannie Shabath Lewis uh, to the partial term ending June 30th, 2023. Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Resolve to appoint Jeannie Shabath Lewis to the Local Development Finance Authority um, to a term ending June 30th, 2023, subject to the appointee meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Uh, is there any discussion? No. With no discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. On the Local Development Finance Authority to a term ending June 30th, 2021. I will pass on that item right now. Next up is the Beautification Commission. This is a board with two openings, one to a term ending June 30th, 2022, one to a term ending June 30th, 2024. It is a city council appointment. Council, is there anyone who would like to make an appointment to the Beautification Commission? Mayor Taylor, Mrs. Zarko. I don't have an appointment, but I need to ask, did we need to postpone the one you passed on? Well, I'm going to pass on it and then we, we're going to take all the postponements at, at the same once at okay. the end. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Resolve to appoint Linda Mida, or Meda to the Beautification Commission to a term ending June 30th, 2022, subject to the appointing meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subsection 4.03 taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. Okay. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Radke. Uh, she was brought forward by the liaison and uh, highly recommended. I think she'll do a great job on the committee. I agree. Anyone else, Council? With no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, second opening on the Beautification Commission. Is there anyone who would like to make that appointment? Mr. Mayor? Mr. Radke. Resolved to appoint Susan Hobig to the Beautification Commission to a term ending June 30th, 2024. So it's the, the appointing me and the qualifications set forth in Charter Subsection 4.03 
taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Same as before. Mm -hmm. It would be a great addition as she was recommended by the liaison. Mm -hmm. Council, any further discussion? I totally agree. Thank you. With no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is the Solid Waste Management Commission. This is a uh, city council appointment to a term ending June 30th, 2022. Is there anyone who has an appointment to the Solid Waste Management Commission? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Sorowski. Let me just get to the language. Move to appoint. Bear with me, and I apologize if I mispronounce. Asherina Isho Opatik to the Solid Waste Management Commission to a term ending June 30, 2022, subject to the appointee meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subset 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? I did speak with her. She would, I think she would be a very good candidate, so I'm excited to have her on this board. Okay. Council, any further discussion? With no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is the Sustainability Commission. This is a commission with five openings to terms ending throughout, uh, well, through different dates, June 30th, 2021, 2022, 2022, 2023, and 2023. Is there anyone on council who would like to make uh, one or more appointments to the Sustainability Commission? Mayor Mr. Taylor. Uh, Mrs. Schmidt. Thank you. Resolved to appoint Jonathan Matthews to the Sustainability Commission to a term ending June 30th, 2023, subject to the appointing meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion, Mrs. Schmidt? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Taylor. Um, Mr. Matthews actually is out in the audience today. He has been attending council meetings um, since uh, he was interested in Mr. Yanez's seat and has spoken numerous times at the uh, podium regarding um, his interest in this commission. He's a school teacher and mm -hmm. I think he would be an amazing um, contribution to this uh, new commission. So that is all I have. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Council, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Resolved to appoint Mark. Oh, why don't we? Why don't we vote on this one? I apologize. And then we'll we'll go to the next one. My fault. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other discussion? Just very briefly, I, t I echo Ms. Uh, Schmidt's comments of Mr. Matthews. I he was one of my appointments that I plan to make, so I do appreciate that she made that as well. He's an excellent voice for the people and voice for students and voice for the community. So I'm really excited to have him on this board as well. So thank you. Okay, Council. Anyone else? With no further discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. There are four more appointments. Mr. Radke. I apologize. Resolved to appoint Mark Graff to the Sustainability Commission to a term ending June 30th, 2022, subject to the appointing meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subsection 4.03, taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion, Mr. Radke? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Graff has been very active in all of our sustainability initiatives. Um, I think he was part of the reason we started this committee. He's uh, done multiple things in, in, um, involving both the nature preserve and other uh, tree initiatives in the city. I think he'll be a great asset to the committee. I agree. Anyone else? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Zarko. Um, would Mr. Radke be interested in changing that term limit to the 630-2023 because I really feel that he would be a good addition to stay on longer because we, he's communicated with us on numerous occasions mm -hmm. and I think, um, I think he would be a great asset uh, for a length of time. I take the friendly amendment. Okay. Uh, is that sufficient, Mr. Kaszewski? Okay. It's, the, the motion is for the appointment of Mr. Mark Graff to the term ending June 30th, 2023. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, so that takes care of the two terms ending June 30th, 2023. We have two terms ending June 30th, 2022 and one ending June 30th, 2021. Is there anyone who'd like to make another appointment? Mayor Taylor. Oh, uh, Mrs. Sorowski. Move to appoint Raylanda Robinson to the Sustainability Commission to the term ending June 30th, 2022, subject to the appointee meeting the qualifications set forth in Charter Subset 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. 
It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion, Mrs. Sorowski? I think she would be a good addition. And I'm very, again, excited to have her on this one. We look forward to our diversity. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Sorowski. Anyone else, Council? Mr. Mayor? Mr. Radke. I, I concur. And mm -hmm. Mrs. Robinson's here right now. Mm -hmm. And I think she's be a great uh, addition to this committee. I think she's going to do wonderful things for the city. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, Council, any further discussion? With no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we have two more appointments, uh, potential appointments to be made tonight. Is there anyone else who would like to make an appointment? If, uh, if not, I would ask somebody make the appointment of Ashley Frank. Uh, Ms. Frank is also in the uh, audience tonight, and I've spoken with her, and uh, she's expressed interest in serving on the Sustainability Commission, and she uh, has a background that I think would be uh, an asset on the Sustainability Commission. Um, so if anyone would uh, be willing to make that appointment, I would appreciate it. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Yanez. Just clarification, was it Ashley? Ashley Frank. Ashley Frank. Um, to resolve to appoint Ashley Frank to, sustain, to the Sustainability Commission to a term ending June 30th, 2022, subject to the appointee meeting, the qualification set forth in Charter 4.03 and taking the oath of office within two weeks. Support. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? Um, I do want to uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Yanez, for that. Uh, for that nomination or for that appointment. Uh, Ms. Frank was also uh, the uh, city administration's recommendation for this position. So uh, with no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Uh, there is one uh, appointment left. Is there anyone who'd like to make that motion or I would, uh, well, is there anyone who'd like to make that, make an appointment? If not, I would entertain a Motion to postpone. So moved. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. I'm calculating something. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to postpone to the. The first meeting in September. So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Okay. <clears throat> that is our agenda tonight. Um, you have the youth advisory board. Oh yes, we do. We have. I'm sorry. We have the youth advisory board. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to make an appointment to the youth advisory board? And actually, we need to do LDFA too. Is there anyone who'd like to make any appointments to the youth advisory board? Uh, Ms. Riska, so what? What do you suggest here? Because we're having trouble. Um, figuring this out and we're not really able to to work through the schools the way that we we were hoping that we would have um, you know the two members of the youth advisory board who were here today uh, seem optimistic that they'll be able to recruit new members but uh, you know teens just like adults right now are having a hard time uh, socializing and getting the word out so and do you have any ideas or recommendations yeah, so first off, um, right now it, you have in your packet that there's 17 vacancies. I did speak with Marissa um, just earlier this evening. Some of the members that are still serving, their terms expired on June 30th of 2020. They did not have the understanding that they needed to be reappointed. So that number will be modified. Um, as for the remaining positions, which I believe there may be five or six of them um, still left, I would just recommend, as we did when we initially created the board, that we leave it off the agenda until such time as we do have recruits to bring to you. Okay. So to be clear, the members who were supposed to be reappointed, do we need to take formal action to reappoint them? We will, and I will bring that back to you next meeting. Got it. Okay. So um, why don't we um, why don't we do that? How did we phrase that last time? It was a. Do you remember? It was like a motion to. Uh, to postpone indefinitely, would that work? Mayor Taylor. M Mrs. Schmidt. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I have reached out to um, Sean Green Beebe, who is the pr principal at Heritage. She is very confident that once school gets back, she can get some middle schoolers involved in this. So um, that's encouraging to me. 
Um, she um, is also going to be on our African American Coalition. So, um, you know, I don't know what you want to do. Well, do we have, I think we have a, an age limit of 14 to 18 on this board, right? Is it 13? Is it 14? We can, we can look into that. But do, so do you recall how we phrased it last time for our motion and Mr. Kashubsky, any suggestions? I don't recall. I don't recall how we did it last time, Mayor, but if we did a motion to postpone indefinitely, a council member could bring it back at a later date or the administration could bring it back at a later date. Okay, why don't, uh, so then why, I would entertain a motion to postpone indefinitely, <clears throat> which would allow for Ms. Riska to bring it back for the members who need reappointment at the next meeting and then any vacancies can be brought back right. at such time, like Mrs. Schmidt said that we have. So I'd entertain a motion to postpone this item indefinitely. So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported. Uh, I believe that there can be discussion no discussion though. Uh, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, motion carries. Uh, then the one item I passed on, the LDFA, um, I would just ask, I suppose that we bring this back. I don't need more than uh, August, is it August 5th, the next council meeting? Wednesday, August 5th. I'd entertain a motion to postpone the LDFA opening to, to August 5th. So moved. so moved. Support's been moved and supported with no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. I now believe that that completes the business portion of our agenda tonight. So I'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is uh, communications from citizens, which would have happened in five minutes anyways. Is there anyone who would like to speak on any item that was not on tonight's agenda? Mr. Jefferson. Um, Charles Jefferson, Sterling Heights. Um, did anybody ever watch the movie Tombstone with uh, Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer? At one point in the movie, Kurt Russell looked at, uh, which would be Doc Holliday, and said, hey, Doc, I thought you were sick. Doc Holliday turned around and said, I might not be as sick as I appear. That might be what Sterling Heights is going through. By the attendance here tonight, I don't think we are sick as people are making us out to be. Because I know Sterling Heights, I've been around here for a long time in Sterling Heights. And when there's a problem in Sterling Heights, people show up. And you don't know when they're gonna show up, but they show up. I always go back to the pigeon ordinance. And the, we had people from New Jersey come here to this meeting on the pigeon ordinance. Tonight's meeting, something happened here tonight. We had all those nominations, two males. I think something's going on here. One lady, I know for a fact, is already on the board of commission. She just got nominated for another board of commission. We had 6,000 people show up at a protest rally. A few weeks later, none of them here. Maybe the police department is not as bad as they were trying to make it out to be. People on the Facebook pages, Mike Radke shows up and tells us that he's no longer interested in putting white people onto boards or commissions <laughs> or having them to do anything else. Then we speak about diversity. We put two males on all those boards of commissions. Something ain't correct. Something's not right here, Sterling Heights. But we still might not be as sick as people trying to make us out to be. Mr. Vanderpool, I got a question for you. Up on Dobry, is it just west of Utica Road there by the Marathon Station, the train tracks? 
Um, if you go down, go through there with a pretty good clip, uh, you might wreck your car. Is there any plans on fixing those? The railroad tracks right there, Dover. Um, also, Mr. Vanderpool uh, is there. What? What's the uh, maintenance plan for the bathrooms in the various parks? Um, is it twice a day, once a day, once a week, once a month? Um, especially during these times, more people out have to use the, the park restrooms. Um, they need to be taken care of. Uh, Mayor Taylor, I'm here to apologize to you about something. Um, for those that don't know, Mayor Taylor, um, back in the day had a rally for President Obama, against President Obama off on the, the steps of uh, City Hall. It only took him three and a half years to have one against President Trump. So you didn't disappoint me. You flip-flopped just like always. I wish you could stand up sometime and go down one road and one road only. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Garropy. I'd like to echo Mr. Jefferson's expression of hope that maybe Sterling Heights isn't as sick as it felt like it might have been. Um, he's absolutely right that when things really matter, people show up. I haven't been to a council meeting in a long time, and this was important enough for me to come down for it. And endure the masks and the wipes and all of that. Um, I think that this community is very resilient. And I commend Mr. Jefferson for recognizing that. Um, we don't always agree, but I really agree with him on this one. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> that kind of a meeting. Yeah, my, my, my apologies, um, <laughs> Mr. Garropy. Um, anyone else under communications from citizens? Mr. Matthews? Jeff Garropy coming to agree with Charles Jefferson. Just my <laughs> mind, I think, short-circuited for a moment. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, let me start off by saying the Youth Advisory Board members that came in here mentioned four areas which, as a school teacher, um, I'm deeply familiar with. And one of them I'd like to speak briefly about tonight uh, is mental health. Um, having worked for the past roughly decade or so in education at the high school level, you see the different types of children that come to you with the different types of households from which they come and the various effects that certain circumstances in their life can cause. Uh, lack of parents, um, substance abuse in the household. There's a variety of things that can create a lot of trauma in a child. And although it is the Youth Advisory Board bringing it up, under you know, the guise of this is the issues that teen, teens care about. When they're not teens anymore, it's not like those issues go away. You still have those people with that trauma and those needs who are now young adults in your community. And it would be very, very wise of us to take a look at the concerns they bring representative of their age group because preventing those problems from continuing and helping treat some of the issues or needs that are there can help prevent a bigger problem from growing in the long run. I would also like to uh, thank the um, city council here for appointing me to the sustainability commission. I hope to make a positive impact on the community. And I don't think that the issue of sustainability is very different necessarily from health in general. We want our community to be sustainable, not just from um, the standpoint of economics and carbon footprints, but also for people to actually live and have a healthy, flourishing life. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a household where I don't think that I 
you know, was wanting for very much, and I would like to see that the next generation of people can do the same. And that health and sustainability of that healthy environment, I think, are very closely intertwined, and I look forward to making a positive impact on both. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else under communications from citizens? If not, I'll close that portion, and we'll move on to reports from city administration. Mr. Vanderpool, uh, and I saw you taking notes about the rail line, uh, anything else tonight? That's correct, Mayor. First on the rail line, I hate to sound bureaucratic, but I have to double check the jurisdiction, I believe uh, that could be Utica's uh, crossing. But nevertheless, I will get an answer on uh, where we're at with uh, a resurfacing there. Uh, with respect to parks, uh, we have a, a thorough cleaning uh, once a day, seven days a week, and then um, a lighter sanitation cleaning midday uh, each day of the week as well. If there's a particular problem with the park, uh, Mr. Jefferson, please let us know and we'll, we'll take a good look at it. Thank you. Mr. Kashubsky, anything tonight? Uh, no closed session tonight, Mayor. Okay. Council, I'll open it up uh, for reports or new business. Mrs. Koski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair to Mr. Vanderpool. Can you tell me, is there a possibility that we could have alternate members for the planning and zoning commissions? Mr. Kaczewski. And the reason I ask is because so often we don't have a full board and the petitioner needs X number of votes and they end up postponing. Is there a possibility that we could have like maybe two alternate members that could be drawn on in case of a uh, short board? I'd have to check, uh, Ms. Koski. The, um, I believe that the Planning Commission already provides for uh, appointment for, altern for alternates, um, but I'm not sure about the zoning board, so let me take a look and I get back to you while. Yeah, if you this. can let us know, because if we can appoint alternates, it might be a good idea to have them available. Thank you. I'll report back to you. Council, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Radke. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to thank everyone who came out tonight. I love to see the city council chambers full of people who are passionate about the things they believe in. And I want to say that everyone here, I appreciate hearing your voice and listening to you. So thank you for coming tonight. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Council, anyone else? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Yanis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just, first of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who reached out to me to ask about my health. I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm fine. Um, um, and I'm not as sick as I, as some people think I am, I guess. Um, but the, so the word of tonight, the word for tonight is process. Um, I think we had a pretty robust discussion on that. And the fact of the matter is this shows exactly what kind of shape Sterling Heights is in. We, we are not sick. We are not sick. After 50 plus years, we still have growing pains and we're growing in the right direction. Look what we did tonight. A after, you know, this is the second live meeting after a bunch of Zoom meetings and, 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 and COVID and everything. Safe Home Task Force addressing a real issue. Mental health is your issue. It's our issue too. It's a very important issue. The Youth Advisory Board coming to us tonight and laying out uh, some of the plans that uh, they've been working on. We had a robust discussion on the inclusion uh, uh, um, committee. Um, went a little sideways, but we still had a robust discussion on it, as well as committees. We are a very healthy, progressive, and growing community, and yet we have growing pains even after 50-some years. I can tell you I'm 62 years old. I got a lot more pains than I used to have, right? But the fact of the matter is, we are still a good, we're not just a good community, we are a community that other people, other communities uh, um, pattern themselves after. Because we do not let grass grow under our feet. And we have robust discussions, and sometimes they get a little heated, but the fact of the matter is, we are always moving in the right direction. And I'm very proud of this city. I'm very proud of how this meeting went tonight even though I wasn't always happy with everything that went on, but I'm very proud of everything that got brought to this meeting, the things that we talked about and the direction that the city is going. We should all be proud. Everybody sitting in the audience, everybody sitting at home. The fact of the matter is Sterling Heights 
is still a very progressive, growing, positive city, a great place to be, a great place to live, a great place to raise a family. And I'm very proud to be on the city council. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody who came out tonight. And I wanna thank my, my city colleague colleagues for putting up with me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yanez. Anyone else, council? Mayor Taylor. Mrs. Schmidt. Um, just one quick thing through the chair to Mr. Vanderpool. Mr. Vanderpool, I am getting um, more and more phone calls and emails regarding the recycling center on 15 Mile. Um, I'm wondering if we can reconsider reopening that. I know part of the rationale was because there's no ingress and egress easily to socially distance. We have to be able to figure something out. Um, yeah, I, I even have been at the recycling center, um, the, the, open, the only open recycling center and have people complaining there as well. So I'm just asking you to look at it again, see if there's something we can do. Um, we have a lot of older residents that utilized that center a lot and have been reaching out. So I would like, um, or, or if there's something else planned, then if you could report that back to us as well. It's just something that just keeps coming up more and more. So um, besides that, thank you all for coming tonight. And um, we're all up here with the best of intentions. And, um, and I'll leave it at that. I appreciate all of you being here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt. Anyone else? Mrs. Zarko. Mayor Taylor. Okay. Um, I'm going to agree with Mrs. Schmidt about the recycling center at 15. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say that between emails and phone calls, um, it, it's for the, I know it's for the residents in that area. Um, it, it's convenient uh, and they have a lot of reasons why they don't want the bin, whether they don't have a, a place for it in their garage. Um, so I can see that we might have to revisit it and, or come up with another plan. But if we can update um, the residents on what the plan is, that might be helpful as well. Uh, the other thing is, when I was going through some of the lists for uh, the appointments, there are people that have moved out of the city that are still on that list. So I don't know what we need to do to up the, you know, because there are people that are, if we appointed them, don't even live here anymore. So I think we need to take a good look at that. And I think maybe the first thing that we can do is if you, if as a council, we recognize somebody that's no longer in the city, that would be the easiest thing is to call and let you know, and then work on it from there. Um, I did have a phone call from somebody that has been out of their home for um, a period of four months, and but still got a water bill that was like $80, even though there was actually no usage. Um, so I was wondering, if, what happens, do we get calls from people that are like snowbirds that are gone for four to six months out of the year um, about the same thing? Do we get calls, uh, you know, ask, or can we explain to them why even though with no water usage, they're still getting that kind of bill? So I think that would be helpful. And I think they all, I think most of us that are here um, are here to serve the residents of the community. We don't always agree, we have different opinions. But I think in order to make us a better board, I would like to see some type of either um, maybe uh, a meeting, and we could start out with just maybe reviewing our um, guidelines for council, uh, possibly um, a retreat of some kind where we actually get together and work as a unit. Um, but I think that would be helpful not just to us, but to the residents as well. Um, and even though we disagree, doesn't mean that we aren't working together, if that makes sense. Um, and I think the biggest thing is, um, I don't think it's right for other members of council to beat people up on social media. I just, I, don't, I think it's inappropriate. So um, I know how I feel when somebody beats me up and, um, and mostly I think that if they talk to me, they might get a different opinion. So, um, but I think that's what, in order for us to be a better unit, I think maybe that's something that we could think of doing in the future. And 
I'm sure if we can come here and be six feet apart with masks, we could do it for some kind of workshop. So uh, I'd really like to do that. And I think that's it. Oh, and then I, I know that we're borrowing this meeting and the meeting or then the building has to get or we're borrowing the building to have our meetings. So I think it would be courteous if we exited on a timely manner and if we wanted to talk to people, we do it outside the building so they can close up the inside of the building. And that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sarko. Uh, Ms. Sarowski. Thank you, I'll be brief. So I did want to uh, echo every, my sentiments earlier, but also my colleagues, thank you all for being here. Your passion, your desire to make us better, to make the city better, ultimately is so successful, regardless of personal opinions or personal beliefs, because we, we will strive to do better, both with pools for the candidates for volunteering, and also how we speak to you and how we address you. I do think that um, social media can be very brutal, and we have to understand that. I, I have the thickest skin in town from being up here after all these years. It's, you say whatever you want to me, whatever. But it, it does sometimes influence other people negatively and that might be the desire occasionally, but I don't, I think everyone believes, they truly believe their point of view and they're gonna put it out there. Let's try to just, everyone who engages, especially those in this room, just remember that we're all in this together and we're all trying to strive for the same thing, that we're all trying to make this place better, this city better. So in that, in that vein, I, would, I appreciate all of you for being here again. And uh, we look forward to having you all back in uh, our next meeting. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Zorowski. You know, I'm gonna, um, I had uh, in my mind going to say a lot of the same things that Mr. Yen has said, so I'm just gonna not say that. But what I will say is, uh, and I thought well, he, he put it very, very well. What I will say is that we are right now in the middle of three historic uh, crises in our country's history, uh, a public health crisis, an economic crisis, and a sort of a, a revolution, a rethinking of how our cities and states and federal government can be more just and equitable. And it's bubbling up in a way that it probably hasn't in the last 50 to 60 years. And, um, and what I will say is that it's affecting local governments and putting the attention and the spotlight on local governments in a way that I don't ever remember during my tenure local governments getting this much attention. Mayors and city councils and city managers uh, are really a focal point, whether it's the city of Portland or Louisville or whether it's the city of New York or whether it's the city of Minneapolis, um, whether it's because of the civil unrest or whether it's because of uh, the public health crises that are affecting these areas. Um, and, and what I think I saw today was a very healthy and productive and positive exchange of ideas. And while it's something that people take very personally and they, they and I understand people wanna see progress made very quickly, we're talking about systems that have been in existence for decades and they're, they're, they're changing, and I think very positively they're changing, but there's a risk, like we saw I think a little bit of this discussion in the Ethnic Community Committee, there's a risk that if you change too fast, you undo things, you throw out the good along with the bad. Um, so I saw this as a very positive meeting tonight. I'm proud of the way that uh, the public came in and interacted with us. Um, I'm proud of the way that the council debated and uh, discussed issues in a way that uh, we're going to have progress, but it might not come today, it might not come tomorrow, but it's coming very, very soon. Uh, so we thank you for your participation and your patience, and uh, we are working through these issues and we need that sort of feedback and we need uh, that dialogue to help create the best system possible for every resident of Sterling Heights. So um, I will uh, leave it at that. Uh, we, this would be uh, normally what I would be saying tonight is that we would look forward to seeing you 
this weekend, this upcoming, well, next weekend at Sterling Fest. And unfortunately, that's not the case this year. Um, we, we ask that uh, you be patient with us. We've gotten questions about parks and things reopening, the splash pad. You know, we were hoping that by now, the governor would have moved us into phase five, but that over the last three or four weeks, we've seen that that's uh, not, not gonna happen probably, uh, well, it didn't happen when we thought it would because of the resurgence of, resurgence of the cases here. So we ask your patience. We appreciate that you were wearing a mask in here. I encourage you to wear a mask out there. Uh, stay home if you can, wear a mask if you have to go out, maintain social distancing and take care of yourself and stay safe and we're gonna get through this. And August 5th is the primary, or I'm sorry, August 4th is the primary. So we will not be having a council meeting on Tuesday, August 4th. Our next city council meeting will be here on Wednesday, August 5th at 7 p.m. I encourage you to get out, vote, or more, more accurately, I would encourage you to stay home and vote. There's still time to do that. There's still time to obtain an absentee ballot. You can drop, drop it off. You do not have to go to the polling location to vote. If you're concerned about the mail, I would say, I don't think you should be, but if you are concerned about the mail and if you are concerned about voting in person, there is the ability to drop it off at one of our drop-off locations. So you can vote. There's no excuse to not vote and vote safely. So with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? No discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all again for coming out and participating.